Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, those of you joining us online as well. Um, I'd like to call this uh, meeting of the City Council to order on May 2nd, 19, or 2022, at 7 10 15. I'm sorry we're late. Um, first matter of business I would like to uh, take care of is our Pledge of Allegiance, and then I've got a couple of changes to the to the agenda that we'd like to discuss, and then we'll proceed from there. Um, with that said, uh, I would hope Edna will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. All right. Thank you, Edna. A couple of things for uh, the audience as well as um, uh, agenda questions for, my, for the council. This evening, uh, Mayor Mulfeld is out of town speaking on behalf of this, uh, for the city at a sustainability meeting run by the Montana Department of Im Environmental Quality, so he was unable to join us this evening. Um, and then uh, Councilors um, uh, Norton and Fury are both ill this evening and weren't able to join us. Um, they'll be fine but they just might fr weren't feeling up to it, I think. Um, and, and questions, you always stay home. Um, that said, we have on our agenda this evening a couple of matters. One is the presentation of the annual review of the Whitefish Convention and Visitors Bureau marketing plan and budget for fiscal year 2023. That would normally be followed by public comment. Um, I'm gonna change the order of the agenda this evening and take public comment generally and otherwise and then we'll go on to the presentation of the, uh, of the, uh, the budgeting for the uh, WCVB, and then we'll uh, approve or make any comments we have um, on that budget at that time. Additionally, um, at a request of one of our council members who could not be here this evening, um, has asked that we consider as uh, and a further change to our agenda this evening, um, that I would uh, ask the uh, consent of or the thoughts of council here. Uh, we have an ordinance, uh, ordinance I think would be ordinance 2207, which is regarding our uh, accessory dwelling units um, and the changes to the regulations on there. One of the council members who cannot be here um, wanted me to ask and see if there was any way that we were interested in delaying this um, discussion of this matter, which has been on our agenda, is on our agenda, and is part of the work we have to do whether they we'd be willing to or anybody has an inclination to move it to a date certain uh, in the future um, for consideration as opposed to considering it this evening. Um, I, I am not in favor of, of continuing it forward and um, the, the request was not only for one cycle but for two cycles. I so it would be that. June, so I'm, I'm not in, I, I, I'm re I think we're ready to vote on this thing. Okay. That said, we're going to keep that on our agenda uh, where it is. Uh, with that said, I would like to open up our um, communications from the public. Anybody that has a comment this evening on a matter that is not a public hearing on our agenda, uh, please come forward, state your name and address for the record, and tell us what you think. Jan Metzbaker, 915 Dakota. I just want to comment on the Whitefish Convention and Vitor Visitors Bureau. Um, tonight, um, being the former director, I really appreciate the direction that they've gone with, um, especially during the issues with COVID, the sustainability aspects of tourism, save our snow. And I think they're really going in a good direction as far as informing the public. I know when um, things go well, you get the credit, and when things don't go well, you get the blame. But if you go to any town outside of any national park in the West, they're all getting inundated with travelers, and it's not because of the ads that the CVV is running is bringing all these people here. So I don't think they should get the blame for the influx because, you know, marketing works, but sometimes it's out of your control. Anyway, I just want to thank uh, Dylan for the great job he's doing, too. Great. Thanks, Jen. Any other public comment this evening? Good evening, Mary Flowery Sissons for Better Flathead, 135 uh, Main Street in Kalispell. Um, I do want to speak to, and I realize the public hearing is closed on the um, issue of accessory dwellings, um, but I am concerned that 
you move forward with this with um, council members absent. I think this is something that needs a full council to look at. Um, and I am concerned that uh, we have a real opportunity here to address affordable housing by creating a new housing capacity in the city. But if we're going to add these, the housing to these zones, I think it really needs to be permanently affordable. And I think this current um, ordinance before you does not address that. I'm very concerned that this simply makes housing in the city even more appealing to um, firms that specialize in coming in and buying housing because it adds a unit that they can rent and profit from and it will, I think, further degrade the ownership of local housing in our community. So I would encourage you to postpone this um, as was requested and I don't know what council member requested it, but I think it's a reasonable request. Thank you. Thanks, Mayor. Any other public comment this evening? Any online, Michelle? For those of you who are online, please raise your hand by, um, oh, Nathan, clicking the hand icon at the bottom of the screen. And Nathan, you can go ahead and speak your name and address and unmute your mic. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. OK. Hey, this is Nathan Dugan, 937 Kalispell Avenue. Um, you know, again, just want to thank everybody that put in the work on the ADU ordinance that's in front of you tonight, and especially the work that's been put in the last couple of weeks since the work session. Um, you know, I think that we're to a place on this that's really pretty amazing. Um, and the incentives uh, that you put forward for the deed restriction program, I think, are going to result in a lot of those being rented um, here for a term of at least five years. Uh, to locals who are living here in town, um, you know, for naturally more affordable rates just due to their size. So um, looking forward to, to you all voting on that and, and moving that along and passing it forward um, tonight. And so we can start to kind of chip away at our, our housing deficits. Thanks. Thanks, Nathan. Michelle, anyone else? Nope, I think we're good. Thanks. Great. With that, I think I'll close uh, the public uh, communications from the public. At this time, we would like to go with our presentation um, of the uh, Whitefish Convention and Visitors Bureau Marketing Plan and Budget, budget for the fiscal year 2023. Good evening, City Council and staff. Um, as you know, my name is Mariah Jose. I am with Nelson Ace Hardware, and I am the current chair of the Whitefish Convention and Visitors Bureau Board. And I would like to take a moment to introduce the other volunteer members of our board of directors. This engaged and passionate group of individuals live, work, and own businesses in our town. Besides myself, we have Erica Terrell, who is with Glacier Restaurant Group, Rhonda Fitzgerald, who is with Garden Wall Inn, Edna White with Avril Hospitality, Luke Walrath with Alpine Theater Project, Jesse Farns representing Montana Coffee Traders, Jenny Cloutier with the Big Mountain Commerce Association, Zach Anderson with Abruzzo Italian Kitchen, and Nick Columbus of Whitefish Mountain Resort. Zach and Nick are sadly transitioning off our board, each after serving for over 10 years. They have been integral to our success and forward thinking strategies, and I can't thank them enough, and we will really miss them and their opinions on our board. To give a little history, the Whitefish Convention and Visitors Bureau, also known as Explore Whitefish, is a member organization of approximately 130 businesses located here on Whitefish. Its creation was necessary for Whitefish to receive our share of bed tax do dollars that are collected within the city of Whitefish. Without this group, any funds from Whitefish would be spent by the Glacier County Regional Tourism Board be clear, the state of Montana has a very specific set of guidelines, 37 pages worth, as to how these public monies are spent. In addition to the CVBs, the majority of communities in Montana 
also have what's called a tourism business improvement district. A TBID is only open to those businesses that collect bed tax. All TBID funds are spent by the businesses whose sole interest is to have their lodging properties full. This means that advertising dollars are spent regardless of season and regardless of how that may affect the surrounding community. The Waifu CVB is different and we are pretty unique in our funding source. Rather than TBID, our member properties, member lodging and restaurant properties choose to add a voluntary assessment onto their receipts. This is called the Community Sustainability Fund. Our board, made up of a cross member, a cross section of member businesses, is dedicated to the long-term viability and livability of the community that we all call home. Our shared love of community drives our decision-making process. And I think that you'll see this in the marketing plan that we're presenting to you tonight. So we really, the CBB thanks the city for the long-standing partnership that we have enjoyed with you. And we appreciate your time today and look forward to working with you in the future. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Dylan Doyle, our executive director, who will do the formal presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Maura. Thank you, Mariah. Good evening, Deputy Mayor, City Council, and City staff. Thank you for your time. Um, Michelle's actually going to be driving the presentation for me so that everyone on WebEx can see it. So I'll just be asking for next slide. So you may hear me say that a few dozen times. Um, I'm here tonight, as Mariah mentioned, to present information on the activities of the Whitefish Convention and Visitors Bureau, also known as Explore Whitefish, and to request that the City Council approve the FY23 marketing plan and public budget. For your reference, this information can be found on pages 51 to 89 of your packet. State law does require this approval in order for the WCBB to receive annual funds from the lodging facility use tax, also known as bed tax. In addition to the board of directors that Mariah mentioned, I'm fortunate enough to have an extremely talented and experienced group of staff and contracted agencies as well. Uh, this includes Brian Schott, who is our contracted public relations, communications, and sustainability representative, as well as DBA Advertising, which is based in Bend, Oregon, who is currently our contracted creative agency. Staff members include myself, as well as marketing and sales manager Dan Hansen, and our business manager Sarah Stewart. As far as the format for the presentation is concerned, I'm going to uh, just kind of continue a little bit on the history and background that Mariah started uh, on the lodging facility use tax as well as our organization, um, followed by just a short review of the sustainable tourism management plan and how we as an organization have integrated the findings from the plan into our mission and vision, which has been updated uh, within this last year. Um, and lastly, I'll walk through the bed tax budget for the upcoming FY23 fiscal year and how that budget and those budget items are directly related to actions that were identified in the Sustainable Tourism Management Plan. We can go to the next slide, Michelle. Uh, you can go one more. Um, so just, just to kind of continue a little bit of that history uh, that Mariah mentioned, um, tourism marketing and Film promotion, which is Montana Film Office, is funded through a 4% lodging facility use tax, commonly known as the bed tax. And that got enacted by the legislature back in 1987. Um, and that is collected on guest nights of overroom lodging accommodations. Uh, this funding mechanism has created the current structure, which is the state tourism office, as well as six tourism regions in the state, of which Glacier Country uh, is the one that we are in. And there are currently 16 convention and visitors bureaus throughout the state. Uh, once a town or municipality reaches a certain threshold of bed tax collections, they're able to then apply for those funds to reinvest in their community through a convention and visitors bureau. Um, and we were established as a standing volunteer committee of the city back in March of 2016 as the beneficiary of those funds. Um, it's also important to note that there's a systematic approach to how this 4% lodging facility use tax is actually distributed. You can go to the next slide, Michelle. Um, and again, just some, some information here. Obviously, you know, over 60% of it does go to the state tourism office, um, but it's also distributed actually uh, to many other partners who benefit. That's including state parks, um, aquatic invasive species work, tribal tourism, the Institute for Tourism and Recreation Research at the University of Montana, which does all the economic uh, 
uh, impact analysis for the state tourism economy. Um, and then there's 22% that's split out between the tourism regions and the convention and visitors bureaus. So basically what that means for us is within the collections of city limits, we actually get 11% and Glacier Country gets the other 11% to make up that 22%. Um, if, if those funds weren't reinvested directly in a established CBB like us, the rest of those funds, as Mariah mentioned, would actually just go back to our tourism region. So it's great that we have those funds directly invested back into our community. Um, next slide. Uh, we also, um, in order to receive these funds uh, and spend them properly, we go through a very large yearly approval process through the rules and procedures set forth at the state. This takes about six months. Uh, so obviously we have review and approval by the CBB board, review and approval by the city council. And then we have uh, review and recommendation for approval by uh, the Tourism Advisory Council at the state level for their marketing committee, which is a subcommittee, and then final approval at the state level through the uh, volunteer appointed, uh, governor appointed Tourism Advisory Council, which is a volunteer oversight committee. And then we do an annual audit of those funds through the Department of Commerce. So I spend a lot of time uh, on this process, um, but it's great to have that kind um, of oversight. So I just want you to know kind of that full circle that we go through each year. Next slide. I'm gonna move now into talking a little bit about the Sustainable Tourism Management Plan and how the WCBB has integrated those findings from our plan into our mission and vision. Um, as you recall, back in 2018, the Whitefish City Council adopted a resolution to create a Sustainable Tourism Management Plan uh, committee, which is a volunteer committee. That committee was tasked with developing a joint tourism management plan between the city and CVB, integrating extensive public input and providing a strategic long-term vision and framework for the sustainable future of the whitefish tourism economy. That's a big task. Um, but we had a couple years worth um, of process there and thankfully that pretty much occurred mostly pre-pandemic. We were able to have uh, some big public input sessions here. Uh, in the council chambers, which was great. Uh, the plan was approved by the city council in September of 2020. Go to the next slide, Michelle. Um, with the key pillars of community engagement, community character, and livability. Um, and I think it's really important here to note that our board had the foresight to really look toward the future um, in presenting this idea to city council around five years ago. Um, and has made the commitment to integrate this plan into the fabric of our organization. So this is not something that has been done overnight. There's a lot of foresight and a lot of hard work, um, but it has created a great foundation for where we're headed as an organization. So in order for Explorer Whitefish to effectively and strategically operate on the uh, new destination stewardship goals and findings from the Sustainable Tourism Management Plan, uh, we need to set aside funds to support these goals. But first, uh, we formalized and updated our mission and vision to accurately reflect the new direction of the organization, uh, with the new mission being fostering sustainable tourism through inspiration, education, and partnerships to enhance, protect, and preserve our viability as a year-round community, with the vision of achieving long-term economic and community sustainability through steadfast destination stewardship. Um, and that really, it for us, integrates our idea. I say the word sustainable all the time when I'm standing up here, right? That is really, truly the definition of sustainability for us, is balancing our economic vitality, making sure our businesses are open year-round and can employ local residents who live and work here year-round, while protecting community character, livability, and our environment. Um, and we obviously meet that definition through our inspiration, education, and partnerships that I'll talk a bit about. Um, also, fortunately for us, the state rules and procedures for allowable uh, bed tax use um, expenditures has been updated in FY23, which is excellent. Um, and that allows us for some more local investment in funds that aren't just destination marketing, which is basically what those funds have historically been used for. Um, these changes allow us as an organization to diversify our annual budget um, across destination stewardship and destination marketing um, toward that ultimate goal that I mentioned. Um, and that's listed out in our marketing plan and you'll see kind of, um, that's a good way that both our budgets kind of work together to meet that goal. Next slide. So now I wanna just visit a few of the high priority action items from the Sustainable Tourism Management Plan and how we are addressing some of those. Um, two of the high priority action items were education and outreach that was identified. That's promoting responsible tourism and recreation. Um, another was benchmarking and data collection. 
Um, and I'll also kind of touch briefly tonight on ways that we are integrating two of the high priority um, that were issue oriented action items, which is transportation, including public transit and bike and ped, as well as some sustainable business practices, including but certainly not limited to uh, reduction of waste. Next slide. So education and outreach is one of the ways that we're able to utilize more of our public funds uh, to locally invest. And that's education and outreach through our Friend of the Fish campaign, which we've run for um, a couple years now. This is an on the ground visitor education campaign that's firmly rooted in our six community values. Go to the next slide, Michelle. Um, and informed, of course, by the findings from the Sustainable Tourism Management Plan. Um, we're going to continue this campaign during the FY23 warm season. We're actually extending it now um, because we're able to leverage these extra dollars from May through September. Um, and I'll probably uh, come back here pretty soon with a, hopefully a recommendation from the STMP committee um, to hang those banners like we had uh, last year, um, hopefully in some other locations in town that might get some more uh, pedestrian viewing of those as well as part of our strategy. Uh, Maggie Voison, who's our local uh, Olympic hero and X Games medalist, is our voice for Friend of the Fish again this year, so we'll have some new audio and video coming out um, with that as well. Maggie's just such a great ambassador for Whitefish. We're um, just happy to continue to, to sponsor her and for her to be such an advocate for town. Next slide. Um, another piece of the education and outreach um, budget is um, partnership that we have with the Whitefish Trail, um, which includes um, talking about recreating responsibly um, on our trail system um, as well. Uh, right now, we have had a campaign called Pledge for the Wild, but there is a, a new trail kind of consortium of trail campaigns that just launching called Be Kind, and uh, we actually have a meeting later this week to talk about how we can integrate that um, with some of our messaging and our partnership with the Whitefish Trail. So um, that's a great partnership, um, and the more we can get the word out about um, utilizing our trails in a, in a great way, um, the better. So we're excited about that. Um, just a couple other um, local partnerships, uh, which actually are funded through the Community Sustainability Fund, but I have to mention them because they're new and I think really impactful, is uh, we just had a press release announcing our partnership with Whitefish Mountain Resort and Protect Our Winters, uh, which is a nonpartisan uh, group of professional skiers and snowboarders that activate st ski towns to talk about climate change. Uh, we're the first town mountain partnership uh, with uh, POW, which is great, and we're also going to be involving the Climate Change Action Plan Committee of the city, so some really good integration between various city committees and our ski resort, which we're excited about. Um, we also have a new partnership with Housing Whitefish as well. We are providing a portion of funds uh, for Housing Whitefish to the affordable housing cause, and we're excited and looking forward to continuing that partnership. So I just want to mention a few of those since those are new since obviously I was last up here. Next. Um, the other big development for us uh, with our public bed tax budget is um, what the state is calling product development. Um, it's essentially a way that we can actually invest up to 35% of our public budget, which we are maxing that out this year, on local infrastructure um, that benefits both visitors and locals as well. Um, and um, obviously this is a newly established expenditure for us on the bed tax front, um, but we already have invested in some infrastructure projects and we have some things that we want to, uh, that we've identified as a board um, to make sure we maintain um, obviously our downtown kiosks. Um, you may or may not know we actually, those are actually Wi-Fi hotspots with free Wi-Fi access. Um, for those downtown, um, which is a great benefit to everyone. So maintaining those, um, our webcams downtown as well. Um, and a couple other of the projects, obviously, you know, there, there's quite a few that we can work on, but some of them we talked about is enhancing the snow bus stops um, that are on public property to add a little bit more wayfinding and hopefully to encourage more folks um, to raise awareness of the snow bus and how easy and great it is to ride it. Um, and as well, talking about um, potentially some um, investment for business community with the bear proof containers that I know you guys are all talking about um, and doing some research on. So um, any of these projects have to get approved by the board and they actually have to be um, owned by either a nonprofit, a government entity, um, or kind of those types of organizations. So it works really well with the city and CVB um, partnerships with a lot of this. So uh, we're excited to, uh, to get working on those here in the coming year. And that's kind of one of the big the biggest change that we've seen, which we're all really excited about and really happy to see change at the state level. Next. Um, you know, for us, research um, is really integral to that benchmarking uh, that we mentioned in the Sustainable Tourism Management Plan 
um, high priority action. Um, it's really a way for us to make great data driven decisions, but also just to understand what is happening on town in town in terms of uh, things like our lodging occupancy, our uh, spending on the ground, um, as well as monitoring uh, what we use a program software called Meltwater, which is how we help to monitor media mentions for our crisis communication partnership with the city. You can go to the next slide, Michelle. Um, there's just a few of the ways that we do that. Um, there's quite a bit of that research uh, throughout, sprinkled in throughout our marketing plan. It's really the baseline for how we continue um, to monitor trends um, and what's going on in town. But um, there was some really interesting information that came out, um, which is again, one of those great benchmarking tools um, to really understand destination visitation versus local spending that I just wanted to share with you all. You can go to the next slide, Michelle. Um, so we get what's called a uh, visa view, which is a portion of, which is basically a portion of credit card spend that happens um, in town. Um, it's aggregated by either international, which is everything outside of the United States, domestic, which is everything outside of Flathead County, a card registered outside of Flathead County, and then those that are registered within Flathead County. So I just get those aggregate numbers. Um, and it's been a really interesting trend to see what's happened in the last three years with this spending. So I just wanted to share that with you. Um, uh, my slide's uh, a little wonky, but I'll be able to fill in the information for you. So these are the 2019 numbers. So on the left side, you have the visitor expenditures that's broken out between domestic and international, you know, roughly about 11% international, which makes a whole lot of sense. That's basically our Canadian, uh, thank you, visitation, um, which makes sense, right? 2019 was still a pre-pandemic year. Um, and then when you look across and you actually add flat, full Flathead Valley spend, um, you're looking at about a 50-50 split. Um, keep in mind, every data set lacks, uh, you know, or has some caveats you need to mention. With this, it only captures physical card swipes on the ground, so most lodging expenditure is not in this. This is just on the ground physical swipes. So that's why this is important for me to say that. So you can go to the next slide. Fast forward to, to 2020, obviously a, you know, a different year. Um, international shrank significantly, obviously. Um, with our domestic visitation increasing, right, and taking up some of the expenditures that we lost from our international and Canadian visitors. Um, but what you also see um, is once again, you know, um, still that split again between Flathead Valley and domestic, uh, with that domestic taking up a little bit more than international part of the pie. You can go to the next slide. But then you look at 2021, um, domestic or international still really low, obviously, with uh, the different border restrictions. Um, but what you see is a big jump in Flathead Valley spend on the ground. Um, and that is anyone that has a credit card that's registered in Flathead County, right? So that's a big, that's an interesting way to kind of look at destination visitation versus what's going on for on the ground spend and kind of helping to define a little bit about what's happening with growth. Um, so the key takeaways of this, Michelle, you go to the next slide is you know, during 19 and 20, visitor spending and resident spending, at least in this data set, was essentially equal, right? In those pie charts, about 50% each. Uh, 2021, resident spending jumped into about 60% of the total spending. Um, resident spending in 2021 was 29% higher in this data set than in 2020 resident spend and 36% higher than 2019 resident spend. So uh, just another way to help us provide some really good benchmarking um, information I just wanted to share that with you guys. You can go to the next slide, Michelle. Um, and just to kind of wrap up, um, I'd like to visually look at this FY23 public budget as a pie chart for you all. You can go to the next slide. Um, obviously for us, our projected budget for uh, FY23 for our public bed tax budget is 250,000. Um, this pie chart really shows that diversification of those different line items that I mentioned to you. This just looks a lot different than it has in years past and we're really excited about it. It's nice to be able to, for us to be able to balance a lot of that destination stewardship work that we're doing uh, as part of the Sustainable Tourism Management Plan Committee, our updated mission and vision, and balancing that out uh, with the shoulder season marketing, which accounts for 25% uh, of our budget this year. Um, and so really, for us, this is a visual way for us to really seek um, that balance um, that we're mentioning as we continue to move forward as an organization. So once again, I am here tonight to thank you all first for your time and to request the city council approve our FY23 marketing plan and public bed tax budget of $250,000. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you. Thanks, Dylan. Uh, any questions from council for Dylan? I just have one. Could, could you back up to the, to the 2019, 2020, and 2021? I just, I'm interested to see how the size of each pie 
Sure. Like what was the total spending yep. each in each of those years and how much did it increase? Yep. So you have, so uh, let's see. So those the, it actually gives you the totals up there. Um, yeah, yeah, I kind of went through those kind of fast. So 2019, the total visitor expenditure was 71.2 when you look at domestic and international. And then when you add in Flathead Valley, it bumped up to 141. And then 2020, Michelle, if you want to the next one. And that was uh, for the non-resident expenditure is 74.5 million. And then when you add in Flathead Valley, it's 148. Go to the next slide, Michelle. And then actually, uh, it dipped a little bit in terms of the non-resident in 2021 there, 65.5 million. Um, but then you add in Flathead Valley and it jumped up to 160. Thanks, Dylan. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Michelle. Those are just visa numbers. So the real totals are higher. Correct. Yeah, it's just, you know, it's it's one of those things where it's a good, it's a really good indicator, but obviously, you know, like you said, it's a, it's a sample. Um, obviously, people use a lot of other different cards and things, but um, it is really great data that we've only had very recently, which really, um, I think, is great. That's why I wanted to share it with you. Great. Any other questions from Dylan? Great. Thanks a bunch, Dylan. That Thank was you. great. Thank you so much. Um, Council, I will entertain a motion to approve their budget. Uh, I would move that we approve the marketing plan and budget for fiscal year 23 for the Whitefish CVB. I'll second. Any further comments or discussion? I would just make one brief comment. Um, I, I just want to say thanks. I, I feel like we have are very lucky to have a very forward thinking group and board and staff uh, at the CVB who I think is acutely aware of the problems that we have and is tailoring your response around that. And um, I just want to say that the community should appreciate that. I know I do. Um, I think being forward thinking is really what we need right now in your area. And I think that's what you're doing. So um, we appreciate that. Thank you. Yes, just a quick comment. Uh, Dylan was very clear, but for the sake of the public, this council is approving the uh, public budget uh, and the expenditure of um, the Bureau. So all the rest of the activities that are performed through the voluntary assessment uh, money is now purview of this council. Thank you. And with that, no further comments. All those in favor of the motion? All those opposed, like sign. That matter passes unanimously. Good luck, Dylan. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Continue your good work. And with that, um, we will move on to communications from any volunteer boards. Any volunteer boards in the audience? Want any volunteer boards from the council? Seeing none, we'll move on to um, our consent agenda for this evening. Move that we approve the consent agenda. And I second it. Uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I would recuse myself from this vote as I, my construction business is involved in one of these items. <laughs> um, that's a, I, Angie, where are we? You're gonna have to push it. You okay. don't have a quorum? With that, um, I think we'll push this um, consent agenda to the next meeting and the other thing I would I would note for Michelle um, only because it's a personal matter I think my name was misspelled at least a couple of times That's okay. Frank you could um, adopt the minutes and just uh, move the one item 6c to the next meeting it would probably be best uh, I'll retract my motion uh, and move that's okay with the second okay and uh, move to to approve items A and B of the consent agenda and remove item C and have that appear on the next consent agenda. Okay. All those in favor, aye. All those opposed, like sign. Matter passes unanimously. Um, on 
This, this is a crazy agenda this evening. Everything's getting moved. Um, next up, we have our public hearings. Um, our first public hearing of the evening will be our ordinance 2206, an ordinance, ordinance rezoning approximately 7.035 acres of land located in the northwest corner of the terminus of Pleasant Run, known as Tract 1, the rest of the description onward, and changing it from um, County R3, one family residential to uh, proposal was to WB2, secondary business district, and WR2, two family residential, and adapting the findings of fact. David? Good evening. So back in on March 21st, the City Council um, adopted a resolution 2205 that annexed uh, this seven acre parcel into the city limits. Um, it was currently outside of city limits um, in Flathead County. So when a parcel is annexed, um, we have to change the zoning from county zoning to city of Whitefish zoning so that we could administer the zoning for that district. Um, on that particular parcel, um, according to our transportation plan and our Highway 93 South Corridor plan, that parcel is bisected by the future Baker Avenue right-of-way, um, which heads north and south um, along that area. And then the future land use map of our growth policy, uh, it calls for the western portion of that lot to be an urban future land use, and then the eastern portion of it on the east side of Baker Avenue to be a general commercial future land use. And so um, the proposal that they're asking for with um, WR2 um, is consistent with the urban future land use. It's one of the three future land uses for urban, which is WLR, WR1, and WR2. All those are appropriate in an urban designation. And then WB2 is appropriate for the general commercial designation. Um, currently on that property, uh, the adjacent uses to the north is industrial. Um, there's a, an existing RV park and then industrial zone property. Uh, directly to the south, it's a combination of WLR, which is another urban residential designation, and then uh, WLR with a PUD overlay, which is actually uh, a multifamily use with the uh, parking area for the uh, apartments that are on Pheasant Run. Uh, directly to the west, or to the east, I'm sorry, um, right now it's a vacant parcel. There may be a conditional use permit coming forward for a development um, in the future, but currently that's undeveloped uh, general commercial property. And then directly to the west uh, is WLR property, uh, Park Knoll. It used to be WR1 when it was in our planning jurisdiction, and then when they went in Flood County and came back in, uh, they asked for WLR instead of the zoning of WR1, which was the previous zoning on that property. Um, as far as the uh, future land use goes, the urban designation states that it's generally a residential designation that defines traditional neighborhoods near downtown Whitefish. Um, unit types are generally one and two family, but townhomes and other types of multifamily are also acceptable with the PUD. And then as far as the general commercial goes, it's basically um, similar to our WB2, Highway 93 North Corridor through Highway 40. It's auto-oriented commercial service uses. We also added multifamily. Uh, residential as a potential use in that zoning district. Um, we did mail out a public notice within 150 feet. Uh, we received a letter from uh, Montana Department of Transportation. They commented that the change in zoning should not impact any MDT facility. And then we received several comments from uh, Park Knoll property owners that uh, opposed the portion of the rezone to WR2. And they preferred it to be WR1 and they had concerns about traffic and density. Um, so in looking at a zone change, is it made in accordance with the growth policy? As I mentioned, uh, the growth policy does call this out as urban and general commercial, and both the zoning districts that they're asking for are consistent with those two future land use designations. So it is consistent with the growth policy. Um, looking at does it facilitate adequate provision of transportation, water and sewerage, um, parks and recreation, there is city and sewer wa uh, available city water and city sewer to the adjacent property uh, along the Baker Avenue right of way and, uh, and Pheasant Run. And so if that does get developed in the future, there is utilities adjacent to that. Um, as far as the effect on motorized and non-motorized transportation system, I mean, not, this is just a zone change. It's not a review of any development 
request. We don't know what that's going to be developed at at this point. Um, when it, a subdivision or some other use comes in, then we will evaluate that, whether it needs a traffic study or not. Um, but just the zone change itself won't have an increase in traffic. The future uses might, but we'll have to look at those individually. And again, I mentioned MBT indicated the zone change shouldn't impact their facilities. Um, as far as compatible urban growth, again, this is consistent with the growth policy. What was established for that area is a residential, um, and we have been looking at areas within that corridor for infill development for housing and workforce housing. And so um, we do feel like it's consistent with the growth policy and what the intention is of that. As far as the character of the district, uh, as I mentioned, this is infill. It's surrounded by some industrial properties, multifamily just uh, directly to the south. Um, it's going to be a major transportation corridor when Baker Avenue does get developed. That's going to be a major arterial in the city. Um, so low density residential is not appropriate next to an arterial. Um, the WR2 seems more appropriate. Obviously commercial on one side would be an appropriate use next to an arterial uh, so that traffic noise does not impact um, low density residential development. So in looking at all the different findings, staff did make a recommendation uh, of approval to the Whitefish Planning Board. They did hold a public hearing um, on April 21st. Uh, at that public hearing, uh, the applicant spoke and on their behalf of their request and we also um, had uh, Karen Giese from Park Knoll Lane spoke um, in opposition to the project. And then Adam Kinchelo, who's an adjacent neighbor at 90 Park Knoll, also spoke against the zone change. Um, after the planning board deliberated, they did vote four to one to adopt uh, the staff report as findings of fact and recommended that it be approved. Um, be glad to answer any other questions that you guys might have. Any questions for David on his staff report? Seeing Dave, none. I think you're off the hook for now. Okay. Uh, we advertise this as a public hearing, and we'd like to open up that public hearing now. Any matter, member of the public which wishes to speak, if the uh, applicant is here, they're welcome to speak first. And if uh, if they have any other comments or anything they'd like to say. Good evening. My name is Kurt Vickman, and I'm the owner of this pheasant run property that we're discussing here tonight. So after purchasing the property, we met with the city of Whitefish and Dave Taylor to kind of get a sense of how this Baker Avenue extension would affect this particular property. He pointed us to the Highway 93 corridor plan that um, describes the future Baker Road as a major arterial that will run north-south through this property. And due to the fact it's going to be a major arterial, it called for higher density along what will be a busy road. That the east side of the road was designated general commercial and then the west side designated urban residential. And then, uh, the, and so we selected WB2 as the commercial designation and that's been pretty well received and somewhat straightforward. And then we selected WR2 as the residential urban designation, which has been received by some and problematic for some neighbors in the Park Knoll community. So why did we choose WR2? And that's been part of the conversation we had even yesterday when we met with the neighbors. There were three main reasons why we chose this. Outside of its consistency with the corridor plan and the growth policy, we felt like this was just really appropriate residential zoning for what will inevitably be a major arterial. Not considered high density, right? But just enough density to exist alongside what will be a busy road. So not only did we see it as appropriate. Um, the second reason is we thought it would be a good transition. You know, when you look around the property and, and, and you kind of just walk around that area, like David said, to the north there's industrial commercial RV park, to the east there's multifamily apartments, a hotel, potentially future retail, to the south there's residential apartments, 
along with one residential lot. And then to the west, there's three residential lots in the Park Knoll community. Because, and so when you, when you see that, it just felt like, okay, not only was it appropriate, but it felt like the right transition for what this area needs, realistically. Um, so not only those two things, but the third reason was is that um, we felt like it, it, uh, it began to address, not in a huge way, but in an appropriate way, the need for whitefish to have more housing in what is a growing community. And so I think this seven acre parcel is uh, a good sized chunk that um, we have the opportunity to to do um, and begin to address that. And so those are um, the three main reasons why we asked the council to approve WB2 as the commercial designation, WR2 as the urban designation. And um, yesterday I just wanted to mention we met with the Park Knoll community, I did, and we had a great conversation. And even in, in talking with them, I think this is what it's 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 a, been a really neat process to uh, at times agree to disagree, but at least to have dialogue <laughs> about what we think is best. And so I think that's what um, we're here for, and I guess you're here for. And um, so I'd love to answer any questions about uh, my comments or anything else about the project. Steve, just a, a quick question. Um, why didn't you include any WR2 on the west? Just, I mean, you have a thin strip on the east side of the road because that's all you have over yep. there. Why not commercial on both sides? You know, we actually, we did consider it. And um, in some ways, we thought that might be more appropriate density for what will be an arterial. But when you look at the uh, growth policy or the corridor plan and the map that's in that, it clearly designates this that that other side as um, urban, and so we felt like we just wanted to to kind of honor that which was already approved and be consistent with that. Thank you. Any other questions? I'll I'll just ask a random one, just because I think it's one of the things that uh, will be of concern or that will I'm sure will be identified for us. Have you guys thought through or discussed with the neighborhood how you would, for lack of a better description, buffer the higher density that you would have in your zone for residential than they have up there? Yeah. Well, I think the advantage of this particular uh, property is that it's sizable enough that, and, and if you walk back in it, it's very dense with big trees. And so I think there's a couple big advantages that just the size of that um, will allow us to do that better and the trees and their presence. And so, you know, we, I, I think, you know, WR2 does allow for, you know, single family, duplex, you know, a, a little bit of a variety of that. And I think that's what makes it a good transitional zoning piece of it. So we're confident that we can do that. And at the time when we kind of come back for the development phase of that, I think that's something that we want to make sure that any landscape plan and all the things that will go along with that is looked at by the neighbors and hopefully, you know, I said to them yesterday that we can kind of win them over in this process as it relates to some of our ability to really listen to and address their concerns at that stage in the process. Great, thank you. Any further public comment this evening? Good evening, my name is Karen Giese. I'm 121 Park Knoll Lane, and I wanna thank you guys for the work that you do for the city of Whitefish and keeping the, what's best for the community in mind at all times. Um, and I also wanna start off by saying that we had a very good meeting with Kurt yesterday. Um, it, it was very open and honest on both sides, and I think that that's very, very important. That doesn't always happen with a developer, so I think we need to acknowledge his desire to work with the neighbors in spite of us requesting that you not rezone it to a WR2 in spite of that. 
Um, the property zoning going from, uh, right now it's in the county as a single family residence and going from that to a WR2 is almost unheard of in Whitefish, especially on this small of an acreage. As you know, it's appropriate to transition normally from WLR to WR1 to WR2. <clears throat> Passing this request will set a precedence for all future land development in Whitefish to ignore the current growth policy to preserve existing neighborhoods. This will affect all of Whitefish in the future and the homeowners are not even aware of this at this point. No property will be spared the higher density growth next to it in spite of their perceptions when they purchase the property. So I think that's very important to keep in mind. The WR2 zone request is only taking into account two of its four borders, those being the north and east boundaries and to heck with the established neighborhoods on the west and the south. Um, we understand that you guys want high density along that corridor that's gonna be happening with Baker Street, but um, by degrading the areas that are around on two sides of this property, it's inappropriate to think about zoning it this way. I had proposed earlier that maybe you have a WR1 in the back area and a WR2 in the front area because Kurt is very um, adamant about wanting to work with the neighbors, but as we know here in Whitefish, there's an awful lot of proposals that come through and then um, are dropped and the property is sold. Not saying that he's gonna do that, but, but we know that's a reality. And though Kurt is easy and in, in appears to be good to work with, the next developer may not be. So when you start zoning a, a WR2, they're gonna come in and possibly ask for a PUD and then there goes the other two boundaries. So currently there's not a valid traffic study um, in Whitefish, the last one I believe was done like in March or something, not during the, the busy season. So that is definitely something that as you as a council knows needs to be accomplished. Um, <clears throat> and there, but there, at some point there was a, an intersection study done and the intersection study that was done for Pheasant Lane, which is the road that this development would go out, um, has an F rating which obviously, if you've ever tried to go in and out of any of those areas down there, you know that it's very, very difficult. And that's in the off season. And then when we start getting our tourist season, and as we've seen, this many more people have moved to the valley, um, th it's gonna be very, very difficult to do this. In December, you pass a new 93 corridor plan. In this document, there was an amendment voted in to discourage any future development onto Highway 93 without the traffic coming out to a controlled intersection or light. The traffic from this development will come out on Pheasant Drive, where there is not a stoplight now, and even in the future, there's not even designated one to be there. It would be on Acres Lane there. Passing this zone request in direct, is in direct conflict with your new corridor plan language. You turn down a hotel development partially based on the fact that traffic in this area is horrific already, as you all know, and that adding more trips per day would only make it worse. We would support rezoning this parcel to a WR1 on the back section, and we would like to encourage the applicant to consider this option. There is a huge demand for single family residences, and I believe that he's, he could make that work in with the rest of it, even though you'd have to go through the higher density, but there is definitely a demand for it. So again, I respectfully ask that you turn down this zone request and consider the future of Whitefish before making your decision. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. Any other public comment? Any online? Oh, no, Rhonda. Rhonda Fitzgerald, 412 Love for Ave. I just have one very brief comment. The applicant referred to um, the area along Baker is general business district and that's not right. B3 is the general business district. This B2 is a secondary business district. And for instance, retail is not one of the uh, allowed uses in that area. I just wanted to be sure that was clear because um, wouldn't want it to come back later that he thought that uh, it was general business with retail. But no, not at all, secondary. Thank you. Thanks, Rhonda.
Adam Kinchlow, 90 Park Knoll Lane. Uh, I'm south of Kirk Dixon's property that he just purchased. And so I pretty much second everything Karen said, so I don't have to bore you with the same speech. Um, I do want to thank Kurt for meeting with us on Sunday. Um, very reasonable. I think he's got great intentions for that property, uh, which I think all of Park Knoll can get behind. I think the issue is the, uh, I think we can get behind that blended kind of zone with the WR1 um, and an R2. And I think most people could get behind that who live in a big neighborhood like we do. It's, you know, most of the lots are one acre. Mine's almost five acres. Um, and so I think people can get behind that, but I think just saying, okay, let's go R2, but we don't know what's gonna happen. We don't know what the development plan is. I think there needs to be a little more thought uh, with, with that uh, whole designation, because once we open that door, I have five acres. I can pretty much kind of continue that zoning de designation and it kind of forces the hands of the neighbors around there. And that's not necessarily a good thing, you know, and, and some people have talked about, well, if this happens, they might sell their properties. It kind of, it kind of erodes to the character of the neighborhood. And I think, you know, I really do think he has good, that we can work with him and, and come up with a great plan for it. But I think we need to have a little more consideration of how that, what that whole project looks like because it's the future Baker extension is still kind of a mythical thing to me. It, you know, it, it fronts 600 feet of my property. And um, when I bought that initially, um, I think it's from Holly Carbo and that whole, that whole development that happened. And then the, since I moved in there, the apartments came in, the uh, Hampton Inn came in. So I've, I've gone through a lot of developments since <laughs> since I bought that piece of property. And development done smart is good. Like everybody agrees we need more housing, but I think we just need to have a little more consideration of what, how it's done and um, appreciate your time. Thanks. Great, thanks. Hi, um, David Hunt, 113 Park No Lane, and um, see the Deputy Mayor Sweeney, yes, and Council Members. Yeah. I don't know if you have the written document that I submitted before this, before you, because I'll make some references to that throughout, so that would be helpful. Um, I too would prefer that I was here tonight, uh, speaking in support for the applicant's request. As uh, I and the others do sense that Kurt has the best intentions, he heard um, our concerns fairly. But as Adam said, without further <coughs> concrete development plans, it's tough for us to accept that now because of the unknowns that could happen. If it gets zoned R2 and changes and Kurt's um, uh, projects and, and life change, we're stuck with a property that zoned it has a density capability that is um, greatly different than where we are. So I too ask that you deny this WR2 zoning as requested. It's not compatible with the adjacent properties, west or south, or perhaps table it to see if there's a way that we could work out a unified position with some more concrete details that we could sign up for. Um, my written remarks included an illustration from the growth, pol growth policy regarding erosion of existing scale and character of single family homes within, entirely, within WR2 itself. And that concern is rooted in the fact that the permitted zone densities hit this quantum leap between WR4 and uh, R2, um, where they jumped to 12, and uh, that is everything to do with why we're here tonight. Also in my written remarks, I referenced a growth policy, future land use goal, which addresses the need to protect and preserve the special character, scale, qualities of existing neighborhoods, and continues on about um, neighborhood compatible infill development. That discusses the character of existing neighborhoods rather than simply based on uh, base zone density, so I wanna emphasize that. 
Park Knoll's character certainly includes deeply wooded, low density of less than one unit per acre, and has existed as such for over 35 years. Um, and then next on page two of my written comments, I shared probably the most significant land use goal for segment B um, as it's leveraged in the applicant's responses and also the planning department's finding. That is goal B2, which reads, improve the compatibility of adjacent land uses in segment B. And clearly, I feel that adjacent means in all directions. But the application doesn't really address this sufficiently regarding the WL parcels on the west and south borders. Then continue on with some parsing of objective one, quote, the better buffer low density residential zones from adjacent commercial. And I've asked, where are those low density residential zones in this whole picture? And with the reclassification of urban, if you look at that map on the bottom of that page, um, the entire B segment then is rezoned or reclassified to urban. And uh, to follow would be uh, making those uh, non-compliant zones fit those urban designations. So you remain there with all the zones uh, 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 in the urban classification, except one tiny small parcel at the very top of the hill south of Park Knoll. Um, and so uh, surely this whole exercise within the corridor plan hasn't been just to protect that one parcel. Uh, so I can only interpret then that Park Knoll and our neighboring WLR par parcels are certainly low density residential and should be considered such in zoning actions. Now I'm going to get a little confusing here, I'll, I, I'll try to make it as clear as possible, but if WR2 is intended to provide that better buffering that is sought from the WB2 commercial, as was the case with the initial zoning actions that we faced with Whitefish Crossing um, and launched much of this, including the PUD rewrite, which I know Frank Lo knows a lot about. Um, the zone densities for WR2 and WB2 are nearly the same. With a base of 12 and a, uh, with 18 with the PUD, in WR2 versus 13 and 20 for the PUD and WP2. So we're stuck with 12 and 18 in the residential, 13 and 20 in, in the commercial uh, WB2. So then are we to accept that as that is the intention for better buffering? Um, certainly to us, it looks completely insignificant relative to the quantum leap that we see um, from our one unit per acre density to 12 units possible with WR2. And then finally in the phrase, uh, encourage density residential uh, toward the, the, uh, the uh, arterial, um, it's unspecific and I certainly would assert that WR1 is denser than WLR, which we believe to be far more compatible with the character of our neighborhood. I spoke about some precedents uh, Karen addressed those, um, that WLR is usually adjacent to WR1 with a few exceptions that are separated by roads or well buffered like the lakes. And um, let's see, Director Taylor mentioned that Park Knoll was WR1. Dave, I, I don't recall any time when that was the case. Um, when, and, that, and there might be something you have to you just check a minute on, but um, when we purchased our home in 99, our property was zoned WLR. When Deer Tracks was approved uh, before it became Whitefish Crossing, it was WLR. When Whitefish Crossing uh, was in motion with the apartments over there, it was WLR. In fact, we, we had all the contention between the blending of the WLR uh, because that was our zone at the time. Uh, later, when the administration of the zoning uh, the donut was transferred to the county, we became County R3 for a period of time. When annexed back in in 2018, perhaps, uh, we asked to return to WLR. That was the original zone we had. Our covenants lock us into what we have, which is all the lots are greater than an acre, and we are limited to only one house uh, per, per lot. So uh, that, I just wanted to correct that one. Um, then uh, last... Uh, I realize that planning administration of all of this is a massive collection of regulations, best practices, 
and ultimately best judgment. Um, I'm in, not in any of the seats up here and greatly respect your knowledge, skills, and voluntary time that you put forth in bringing each of these issues uh, to conclusion. And I'm here to share my perspective as one of the multitude of those inputs that you must consider. Uh, I believe that our meeting with Kurt yesterday was very positive and allowed both perspectives to be shared comfortably and in good faith. We're here because those fundamental different perspectives can't be bridged at this time without more certain plans. And I've pointed to several pieces of published city plans, code, and precedent actions with respect to the WLR zone. And I'm gonna thank you all for your consideration and certainly your service to our community. Deputy Mayor, can I ask a question? Uh, can I ask a question? Not normally, but sure. Thank yeah. you. Uh, David, sure. thank you. Just a quick question. I'm checking um, in our packet you uh, uh, had a public comment and written to the planning board yes. in April 13. Did you raise the same comments and the same packet that you're raising today here to that planning board meeting? Some. I've added several, you know, as I've had a little, this all inter intersected with, with a planned vacation, which was the first our family was able to take under COVID for a long time. So uh, I was away for a period of time and couldn't really focus on this until I got back. So I did add a few in the comments that I submitted and those that I spoke to tonight. Even Thank you. So. Thanks, Dave. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Any further public comment here in the, in the hall? Mary. Good evening, Mary Flowers, Citizens for a Better Flathead, uh, 135 South Main in Kalispell. Um, you received an email from me earlier today, and just for the record, I would like to note that um, there was not access to this agenda item uh, to prepare comments um, over the weekend uh, because, and Michelle spent some time talking with me about the issue today, but unfortunately, there are a number of places within your website to access information uh, the one I traditionally use um, was not, uh, the uh, Ben's project was connected there rather than this project, and so I couldn't access the documents. She made a correction uh, to the website, but then none of the items were available. So I wasted valuable time trying to just access the information. But I do want to say that Michelle is incredibly patient and respectful of when problems like this arise. And I realize they arise, but I would like the hearing record to reflect that there was not adequate um, access to the information to comment in a timely manner for today. Having said that, I do have some comments that I would like to make. Um, and one goes back to comments that you have heard from um, Michelle Tafoya representing the South Whitefish Neighborhood Association, um, arguing that the changes to the zoning that were made to the land use map that was um, made under the quarter plan um, were not made in accordance with the growth policy. And so I want that uh, factor to also be part of this hearing record. Having said both of those, um, I think we have a process which could really be improved. Um, when you have a community that works as hard as Park Knoll does to reach out, to meet with, uh, in this case, the person who's bought this property, it's really unfortunate that things get tossed back in your lap. And I would really encourage you to toss this back to the developer and the neighbors and to ask them to really look if they can't come forward because I think what you have before you, you and your hearing record are alternative findings of fact which would support denial. But I think you have on both sides the desire to provide housing for our community, but to do it in a way that respects the current neighborhood character. And so 
I think we need to really think about these processes that kind of um, an annexation that doesn't come with a site plan when you're looking at annexation. So you can identify some of these issues up front. And I think we've talked in a number of other situations about the need for a site plan um, when property is annexed um, and the issues that came up with the town pump when you didn't have that. Um, I would ask you to spend some time looking at the alternative findings. Um, this is being proposed as just a zone change because of the annexation. But this has much more long-term ramifications in terms of the future development. And I don't think it's fair to ask the neighborhood to wait on promises. Um, the developer and the neighborhood need more fair predictability. And I think by sending this back and really encouraging the developer and the neighbors to see if they can come up with a compromise would be the appropriate uh, solution tonight. I think that's it, thank you. Great, thanks Mary. Um, for point of clarification, and I know you had frustrations Mary, but that information was on the website, several other places, all of us got it, we had no problems getting it. I appreciate your concern, I know you work with Michelle and Michelle did work with you, but it was there and it was accessible. Um, I'm glad you found it and I'm glad you were able to assess. As you know, I work on that website and go yep. to it lots. I know. And if I had that kind of problem, I know there are others. Um, and so. Uh, okay, I appreciate that, I do. I really yep. do appreciate that. And a uh, question for you, David, do we have a timeline under which we need to manage this problem? Well, since it's an annexation, um, we have to put whitefish zoning on there. So the longer it stays county zoning, and we can't administer a county zone. Um, and so whenever something's annexed, we try to get it, a whitefish zoning district applied as quickly as possible. And, you know, the typical, you know, if someone does annex and then what they're okay with the equ equivalent of the county zoning, then that process goes a little faster. In this case, they're still asking for something consistent with the growth policy, just a little bit different than the existing county zoning that was on there. Okay. And so that's why the applicant is the applicant instead of the city, because typically the city's the applicant on an annexation. Correct, okay. I just, I want to clarify that for all here. Um, the other thing I would like to identify for the applicant is, as well as the rest of the audience, um, we are here with a bare minimum of a quorum. As a result, any ordinance that's brought to us must be passed effectively unanimously. If we proceed with this matter at this time, I'm not projecting where this is gonna go, um, but I'm telling you that, um, that that's a possibility. If you wish to withdraw it, um, we would consider that as well and, and work on it further. Um, if that is something that suits you, if you want an answer now, we'll proceed as best we can. Um, but that's just so you know, that's where we're going with this thing um, because of the quorum that we have in front of us. Do you understand? Okay. I didn't make you happy, I understand. <laughs> right? Correct. I'm sorry. Can you, uh, we've been, I've been trying, try uh, can you speak into the microphone? And I, cause I know I asked you a direct question then. I guess it was my understanding that we had to determine zoning, you know, based on, on what, where this process uh, was at. Okay. So and, you, and so I, I guess what I'm confident in is that, um, that we can, you know, work with the neighbors to get this done. I, I guess I, I would ask back to you, what what would you suggest would be the alternative, or is that? I'm gonna ask a question. Uh, yeah, sir. Would you be would you be okay with waiting two weeks when we have potentially two more uh, council members here and 
and it wouldn't require a majority vote to pass. If, if you, because if it doesn't, if you don't get a majority, you, you, unanim, I mean not majority, if you don't get a unanimous vote tonight, then, then the zoning request fails. So that's, that's the predicament. Okay. At, at the same time, David, correct me, I'm wrong. This is a little bit of our timeline trying to get this thing. This is not pushed by anything in particular. If we take another week, two weeks, or a month to bring well, this back, we're not in any danger here. That's correct. Okay. I mean, yeah. But I mean, the sooner we can get whitefish zoning on there, probably the better in the long term. But yes, I mean, you guys, you know, if you were to vote to deny the project, you know, I would probably ask you, to, is there an alternative zoning that you guys could vote for so that we could get the zoning on the books rather than just having to start the whole process over again? Right. Because that's another three or four months, right? So. Yeah, no. <laughs> and no, and, and that's what I'm trying to get a, get a, a clear picture so we all understand where this is possibly going. I don't want to waste the developer's time or the neighborhood's time or our time having to do something like that. Um, I want to get it to the extent we can get it right the first time with whatever margin of error we need, that's where I would try to head. Um, so that's so it. Yeah, yeah, I mean, in the case that, that you know, and if you guys are unanimous one way or the other, then we could probably work out something where we chose to delay it until we could work out something that would be more beneficial in two weeks or, um, you know, potentially if you guys, you know, because we have to put some kind of zoning on there right. at some point. So you could, you, you know, basically hold, postpone it till May 16th or whatever the date is. Yeah. Okay. Or even the 1st of June. I mean, that wouldn't, that's not going to herald up Texas. Okay. Here, just in case, just so you're prepared, that's kind of the lay of the land here. This timeline is not statutorily driven. It's driven by a desire to get some whitefish zoning on that property. And what you proposed is what you proposed. Um, and we would vote on that if a motion comes forward. Otherwise, there might be a motion to table to a date certain. And if we did that, is that something that you would um, entertain as an opportunity to work further with the neighborhood? Is that what? Is that how you would take that? Uh, yeah, I think. I mean, I think trying to work something out is always, you know, our first, right? Or my first desire here. So, um, you know, I, I think, you know. Steve, you were at the planning commission meeting, so you kind of have a sense of, of these things as well. So I would you know, defer to some of your perspective on this as well. So. All right, well, thank you so much, yeah. and I appreciate it. I just wanted to make it very clear where we were. Um, with that said, um, the public hearing is closed. I will turn it over to council for a motion or further discussion. I have a couple questions for Dave, if I may. Yeah. Um, uh, where did I write them down here? Um, oh, what is the buffer? What's the buffer distance on the rear setback for an R2? So R2 has a 20 foot setback from the building to the property line on the rear. Okay. And that whole pro that whole parcel is wooded, correct? Yep, it is. And the, yeah, Park Knoll is wooded as well. Okay. Um, and on the west side, it abuts three properties, three properties yeah. and all those houses are built towards the driveway, not towards the back of those properties, right? That's correct. Yeah. So it's the fourth property, the one to the south, where that it's truly adjacent. It's pretty close, yeah. Okay. And would that be considered a back setback to that property? It depends line? on how the lots are laid out. You know, if it's subdivided and where the roads are located, that's going to determine what's the front and what's the side and what's the rear. Okay. You know, and that when it's subdivided, obviously, and they'll have an opportunity to provide even greater buffers if they need to or, you know, with their lot layouts. Okay. And just for clarity for the public, if this, if there were a PUD on this property, they would have to demonstrate substantial public benefit in order to have the yep. and 30% open space, which could additionally be used for buffering. Okay. Um, and then do we ever, do we require a traffic study for a zone change? No. That's that's a requirement of a development proposal. For, for a correct? development proce project, yeah. Okay. Um, and then in terms of along Baker Avenue, the, the connection, which I do agree is kind of a mythical sort of idea at this point, um, would, would we want to see WR1 
adjacent to that? I mean, typically arterials have such a high traffic count that, yeah, you know, R1 is still an urban density, but it's, you know, a lower density than R2. I mean, typically with the way we developed the corridor plan, knowing that there's commercial property along there, I mean, typically how you buffer commercial property is you put your high density next to the commercial and then it slowly gets, you know, lower density as you get further away towards the suburban densities. Um, but yeah, typically next to arterials is where you want to put your higher density developments or your commercial developments. It's because of traffic noise and all that goes with that. And also um, for the availability because of the higher density people, um, they have access for you know bikes and trails and public transportation and walkability. Okay, thanks. I think that's all I have. Stephanie. Um, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I move to postpone this item uh, until um, either the next city council or two city councils from now. Um, that's my motion. Is that a second? We can discuss that. Is it one or two, Giuseppe? Uh, postpone. Till for how long? To a date certain? Well, uh, to a date certain, yes. Which one? Next council meeting or the one after? Uh, I do not know the attendance. I, I would, I, I guess my, my question, Dana, if we're gonna entertain this, in terms of time fit for other matters, where could this be reslotted most comfortably? We have May's and we have four public hearings in May uh, at the next meeting. Um, June right now, we have two CUPs. So um, we have two preliminary plats at the next meeting and some other um, ordinances. So, you know, June 1st maybe, but I think they're both gonna fill up pretty quickly, so. I, I move to June 1st. Okay. It's a point of clarification. Sure. Here. If this council was not, if this does not pass, if we voted on this and this does not pass, is this simply just going to come back next meeting anyway? Well, if you vote and don't pass it and don't, I mean, just deny it, then we'll have to come back with an alternative zone change, but go through the whole process again, where it goes to the planning board and comes through the whole, we notify the neighbors and start is all over with, with a denial, with a postponement, you know, I mean, if you were to, I mean, what's, what is a, if it's a three to one vote, is that a denial or a, I mean, if a effectively, because you have to have a, for an ordinance, you have to have four votes of the council, but you have opportunity to have an alternative motion, you know, at that point, because I don't mean, it's not like there's four votes to deny. If someone moved to approve it, you didn't have enough votes to approve it. I think there's opportunity for, at that point, to postpone action to the next meeting when you have more council members present. If, and you, you agree, disagree? Yes, it is. <clears throat> I think if you, if there's a three to one vote, it's denied. I don't know that you can come I back with an alternative. I think the applicant has to come in with something else. So. I think the impact of a postponement as opposed to denial is how much rework is gonna have to go through this thing um, when it comes back to us whenever it does. Um, and I, um, I think that the choice of uh, June 1 makes some sense on a couple of levels because it gives the developer and the neighborhood a little more time to talk, to potentially work out um, an agreement as to what everybody would be happy with. Um, I know we'd like to move these things through as quickly as practically possible, but this is not one of those kind of developments. I, I, I get that. I, I just don't think that, it doesn't sound like that the, the neighborhood is gonna accept WR2 on that whole parcel and I, I don't, can they change the zoning request at this point? I mean, would it? I mean, this is what they asked for. I mean, the council has the option to say, you know, they will give you WR1, but not WR2, and then approve it that way. Um, but could they slice off a part? Well, where does that WR1? line go? Yeah, ha to half and half, we need a meets and bounds description to do a zone change. And so it would have to go back to, and the surveyor would have to figure out where that line was, and we'd need a meets and bounds. Okay. If it's, right now it's cleanly on that right of way, which has already been delineated the center line of, uh, through a survey. So that portion of the WR2 is right on the, goes to the center line of Baker Avenue as all our zoning districts go to the center line on the right of way, same with the WB2. If you're gonna split that into two, it would be pretty complicated. And it would okay, I, I think, I mean, possibly the only thing that's gonna 
make it better is if, um, if, if Kurt comes with some sort of development plan that they can look at and then maybe they'll support the zone change, but I don't know if that's even a possibility because I mean, it's a lot of work to put together a development plan without knowing if you're going to have the zoning for it or not. I couldn't agree more. Um, that said, we have a motion on the table. I do not have a second yet. Am I going to get a second? All right. I would rather see it for the next meeting. I think that I don't, I think we need to go up or down on this. We need as many people here as we can, but I just don't, I don't think waiting. Uh, so the motion is for June uh, 1. Uh, I would support point of May order. 16. Yeah. May I amend my motion you to uh, next meeting in May? Uh, postpone this discussion for to the first next meeting in May, please. That's much appreciated. No, I would I would prefer it be left open because what's going to happen, Steve, yeah. is I suggest that there will be mm -hmm. at least discussion of changing the proposal, um, and I, so I think you'd want to have the public hearing remain open if we get a change proposal. Don't you? I don't see what substantively, gonna, substantively is going to change in the zoning request between now and then. It's not going to have a, I mean, all we're talking about is a zoning request. Is this, correct. The, is this the correct zoning for this property? I don't see that substantively changing between now and two weeks from now. I, I think it's, that's what we're going to be voting on, same thing. But that's okay, um, that said, I, I hear what you're saying. Um, as I hear Giuseppe's motion, um, which I guess waiting on a second, and I just want to correct it, is to postpone this matter to the June 1st, no, to the uh, second meeting in May. Um, is your motion to leave the public hearing open? My motion is to leave the public hearing open, and I'd like uh, to discuss this after, if the, if the motion is seconded. Okay. Um, I'll second it. Second it. By Councillor Davis, uh, further discussion? Sure. Uh, this is an ordinance which normally in zoning is, is a legislative act. At the same time, we're sitting here in quasi-judicial manner. Am I correct, sir? So for clarity of the public, there is no way we have discussed any of this, no we can discuss with any out there. While normally an ordinance can be discussed, can be uh, prepared, can be lobbied about. So it's a, a can, kind of unique case. There have been other ordinances that have come to our table here where we felt it was fair and just to wait for two more members of the council. And I was the beneficiary of one of those. I was in here uh, at the last uh, meeting. So I, I think given the nature of hybrid, legislative action with quasi-judicial powers, and the fact that we have to vote unanimously to make a, a decision one way, I am suggesting that uh, if nothing else, we have the full council sitting at this bench. So that's the reason of my postponing. Ben. Uh, I second on this motion simply because I don't think it's fair to all parties that we vote in this manner. Um, we have a situation here where this council could have a three to one vote, for example, right now in favor of something and it would fail and you would have to start all over again. And I don't think that's fair to the applicant. Um, so I just, I, I express no judgment one way or another. I'm not um, sending this back to go think of it, think it through again or anything like that. I'm just simply saying that it is not fair to the applicant for us to vote for this right now. And so I think it would be in everybody's best interest. Why don't we just wait and um, resume later. Um, any further comment? Um, I would concur um, with both Giuseppe and with you, Ben, as to a good reason. I think there's, um, unlike Steve, I do believe that there is a possibility that the neighborhood and the developer will have further discussions and we may see something different. And I think that's a good reason to leave the uh, public hearing open. Um, it also would respond to some of Mary's concerns about adequately having an opportunity to uh, read and review um, the application as well. Um, and so with that said, um, all those in favor, all those opposed like sign and the matter pa passes unanimously.
it's delayed or postponed till second meeting in May. May. You good to go? Good. Thanks. Um, let me see. Yes, ma'am. Did you guys vote on that? Yes, we just did. You did? Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we voted Suraship yeah. should be. Yeah, it was four to zero in favor of postponing it to. <laughs> so keep me on track, Michelle. You could you catch me. All right, thank you. Um, all right, that's for, it's now, <coughs> well, we can go on a little while longer. Our next public hearing is what would be our ordinance, I guess now, uh, 2206, an ordinance amending the zoning regulations, Title 11, Chapter 2, uh, Article A, WA Agricultural District, Article B, WCR Country Residential District, Article C, WSR Suburban Residential District, Article D, WER a state residential district, and Article E, WLR, One Family Limited res, uh, Residential District, Article F, WR1, One Family Residential District, um, and Article G, WR2, Two Family Residential, uh, Article H, WR3, Low Density Multifamily Residential District, Article I, I believe this is, WR4, High Density Multifamily Residential District, and Chapter 3, Section 1, Accessory Apartments, and Chapter 9, Section 2, Definitions of the Whitefish City Code, postponed from our March 4th meeting, or April 4th meeting, I think. Good evening again. Um, so this has been through several iterations. I'm just going to give a quick brief summary since we've already had a public hearing on this as well as uh, several work sessions. Um, but just back in 2017, we adopted a strategic housing plan that uh, basically called for all ADUs to be a use by right. Um, the residential zones uh, allow existing units to be rented long-term by lifting the limitation allowing long-term rental when the primary unit's a primary residence, um, eliminating a single level requirement, and then uh, looking at some other um, s strategies. Then the, the council, uh, appointed a strategic housing plan steering committee um, that continued to look at the implementation of those things, um, put together a draft that went to the planning board. The planning board had a public uh, work session as well as a public hearing and modified that draft um, to try to make it more consistent with the strategic housing plan. Um, on April 4th, there was a public hearing before the city council. Uh, the council then uh, wanted to see further changes at a work session on April 18th. Um, out of that work session, uh, the council asked uh, Councilor Sweeney and Davis to uh, sit down with uh, staff to kind of pull together a, a, a common um, draft in between those different uh, conflicting ordinances or different changes. Um, and out of that, uh, this draft that we have before you today, um, with so the, the minor changes that came forth out of the, uh, since the last draft, would be a, a voluntary local resident deed restriction to lease with 12 month leases for at least five years, uh, which gains someone the following incentives for an accessory dwelling unit. Uh, no additional parking requirement for the ADU. Uh, there'd still be a parking requirement for um, the ones that aren't deed restricted of one parking space per unit. Um, an ADU could go up to 800 square feet rather than the standard 600 if they chose to deed restrict for 12 month leases and then eligibility for additional legacy homes prog program incentives, which could include um, building permit fee or impact fee reimbursement, depending on funding uh, availability. And so with this draft, both deed restricted and standard ADUs would be permitted and allowed to be rendered without restriction in residential districts, as long as they meet the zoning requirements, um, which would include a review for, of conformance with a future uh, design guideline and best practices manual, which um, we'll put together. And then um, a requirement that no stairs in the front of the primary unit be allowed unless pre-existing. Um, and then maximum roof heights for detached ADUs uh, would be increased to 26 feet to allow for matching steeper pitched roofs um, while setting a two-story limitation, uh, mostly because um, in order to do two stories over a garage, you pretty much have to do a 412 pitch roof or less uh, to get the necessary heights for both the garage and for the dwelling unit. Um, 
based on these standards um, in the your packet there's a chart on page 176 that basically uh, does a comparison of the existing regulations uh, the planning board recommendation and the new regulations I kind of already gave you a summary of those things um, we did it receive about 20 letters of support for the changes to the AD regulations. There were two letters opposed and a, another one that was concerned about uh, eliminating the parking requirement. Um, yeah, I don't know how much other background that you guys want since we've already been through this in the public hearing. You guys are probably pretty familiar with all this, but just kind of wanted to give you a quick overview of the proposed changes. You guys have any questions? Questions? I've got a few, David. Um, can you clarify for me and for the public where in here that we require, I read it, but I wanted to, uh, questions were raised about where it is required that if you want to take advantage of this program that you have to deed restrict, the properties would then become deed restricted for that five years. So under the... Um ordinance here so um, under this title three and our special provisions of uh, chapter 11 of our zoning code um, we have a chapter about accessory dwelling units currently it's called accessory apartments we're modifying the standards of that chapter so we're adding a purpose to that statement which was you know create a affordable housing option for workforce housing whitefish residents um, kind of talks about why we do it they support efficient use of existing housing stock and public infrastructure etc and then um, it goes through the requirements. It may be detached or detached from the unit. Um, talks about the height of the requirement. Um, that it must remain accessory to the primary single ho family home and may not be sold separately. Um, any part of the structure non-conforming with respect to setbacks or height may be used for an ADU. You know, that section I mentioned about exterior stairs. And then uh, design of it should be consistent with ADU design guidelines and best practices. Right. And then under H, it talks about if a property owner chooses to enter into a long-term lease for a local resident and opts to place a deed restriction on their property for its long-term lease to a local resident with a minimum of 12-month lease for a minimum of five years, the project is eligible for the following incentives, um, which would mean increasing the floor area up to 800 square feet, right. um, no additional off-street parking requirement for that unit, and then potential additional incentives for the Legacy Homes Program, which and would be financial. And my question was, is there a requirement, if they apply under that portion, that the property receive um, a deed restriction yes. and it be placed on the plan? Yeah, it'd be a deed restriction that would be in place for five years. And okay. then if they could choose to renew it if they wish. But, um, but yeah, be a f in order to get in that program, they have to do a deed restriction for five years, okay. 12 month leases. Okay. And then we'll further, through our legacy homes uh, standards, which is a separate section that's uh, approved by resolution of the council. We'll go into more detail of what that program means, what kinds of inc other incentives we would offer, and all that kind of stuff. Um, um, question two, um, again, just for clarification purposes, um, is it possible for somebody participating under the, uh, the program, I'll call it, that they could rent the uh, ADU and not be, they would be allowed to, but wouldn't be required to rent the primary unit, the primary residence. On yeah, the I don't think there'd be a requirement that both units be rented. Obviously, they might live in one of them or not, but, but the right. ADU itself would have a 12-month minimum lease requirement. Right, and if they wanted to, if they wanted to, the only way they could lease the primary residence is if it was also on a 12-month lease. Nope, they could, le they could rent both units out as long as it was on a 12-month lease. So no. So it doesn't require the primary unit to become... No, either a unit could be rented out. Under yes, this. right. But the, but the ADU would always have to have a deed restriction on it. Okay. But the primary house would not have a deed restriction on it. They could choose to live in it. They could choose to rent it. They could choose to keep it empty, you know, whatever. Like any other house in the city. Right. You can choose to do that with. Correct. But we're part of this. 
amendment, if I'm not mistaken, and I think we're uh, all hoping for, is that we're going to actually produce some housing for people who want to be residents. That's that's and correct, which that's is correct. what the, the yeah. deed restriction gives them that. Right. Gives but that least, permanent housing for local residents in the right. ADUs. Um, but under the way it's currently drafted, the primary residence, if they were to rent it out, is not restricted in any way in terms of the time frames it could be rented. That's correct. That's something I'll discuss later. Um, have we discussed or thought about the possibility of restricting uh, ADUs in our resort residential districts? You know, we've, I don't know that we've ever even had a application for an ADU in a resort right. residential district, but um, to my, they, since I've been here for the last 14 years, I've right. never seen one application for an ADU in a resort residential d district. But Okay. My question is, times are changing, opportunities abound. Um, is that something that we should be considering under the circumstances? I mean, if the council directs us, we could bring forward an amendment that, you know, would not allow an ADU. Um, most every one of the resort residential districts is a multifamily zoning district correct without much limitation on the number of units correct um, so somebody could turn their home into a duplex or a triplex right and rent all those units out so i don't know what would it effectively solve anything to restrict adus i'm asking questions for a reason i want i want to have those kinds of answers thank you um that's it any other questions from council for david We advertise for a public hearing. Um, oh, it is it is closed this evening. Um, again, with with this particular matter, uh, we are not under any um, timeline requirement to do this. Um, we want to get it done as quickly as possible, um, and also recognizing that no matter what is done here, it will take all four votes to uh, approve it, um, and. Anything short of that, it fails. Um, and so I offer that to you as an opportunity to, in making your motions um, for approval or delay, whichever you choose uh, under the circumstances. Uh, With that, I'll turn it to the uh, council for a motion. Deputy Mayor, I move to approve WZPA 22 06. The findings of facts uh, in Exhibit B and the language in Exhibit A as recommended by staff and by the planning board. I'll second it. Motion has been made and seconded. I would offer um, a, an amendment um, to the requirements that if a participant in this program uh, wants to rent both facilities, both the primary residence and the ADU, that both must be rented for 12 months minimum. Um, and I offer that as an amendment to these guidelines and my theory on, on that I will speak to if, if I get a second. Point of order. Sure. Uh, 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 is it uh, me making the motion be the first to speak to amendments as well? It, you don't have to. You I have some amendments. You, yeah, well, if, if you and if you have amendments that you would like to pursue on this matter, um, let's get this one out of the way and then we can go back to you. I, I was not aware that you had any. So that's it. Is there a second to my motion? Question? Sure. Angie, is this something we can do? Can we require that both units be, I mean, we're already treading on pretty thin ice by requiring any sort of thing, anything that goes beyond the Landlord Tenant Act, aren't we? And if it's a primary residence versus an ADU? Yeah, I think, um, I think there are some legal problems with requiring both of them to be rented when you're telling people who they can and cannot be rented to. Um, I'm comfortable with the provision with ADUs that they be rented to. Uh, would be local or a person with the desire to be local because it, it's an incentive you receive for doing that. That's not mandatory. Um, it's voluntary. So we're not 
telling basically them what they can and can't do. We're offering incentives if they do choose to rent to a local resident. I think when we're telling people who they can and can't rent their own property to, we could get them to some hot water. Just for clarification purposes, um, it is not the intent of my uh, motion to in any way restrict who they can rent it to. I am, however, if they're participating in this program and taking advantage of it at their own free will, I think one of the requirements ought to be that if you want to rent both facilities, that they both be rented for 12 month minimums. That's that's my motion. That's my oh, intent. Okay. I'm not I'm not trying to restrict what okay. they do or who they rent it to. So Frank, you're just talking as if they want to receive the incentives, they have to. Okay, I'm exactly. sorry, I misunderstood you. That's right. And may I ask you a, a question about sure. um, case, case, real case? I I will build an ADU detached, and I will rent it 12 months long term. But I live in my own property. Right. So say I buy another property still in Whitefish, and, and I move there two years into it. Right. So I've already taken advantage of the benefits, mm -hmm. and uh, now my old property I'm leaving it. And for my zoning, I can rent it uh, at a minimum of a month each time. Will the city enforce on me two years after, in, in, in your motion, mm -hmm. okay, uh, a minimum 12 month rent out of a property that when I enrolled in the program, I lived in? Right. So how do you see that? In my, my intention would be yes. The property would either have to be rented, uh, either the owner occupied or if they was participating in the program for their ADU and they wanted to rent the primary residence during that first five years, the answer would be yes. You would be required to rent it for a minimum 12 months under my motion. Did I get a second or not? Fortunately, my motion dies for want of a second. Um, that said, uh, we're back to uh, the primary motion. Giuseppe, I th think you said you wanted to add some yes. possible amendments. Well, and, and can I speak also sure, to that? Yeah. Okay. First of all, this is, a, uh, I think, a bigger deal than the, da the data shows. We've done surveys, but we've done to the ones who could build an ADU and the ones who applied for an ADU. Nobody yeah. asked me as a WSR owner if I would have been interested. So there is a missing data. And I think that missing data uh, offers much more potential for uh, the detached ADU and the new zones that can have a, a admin authorized ADU. Uh, I'll, I'll make a bet. We will see, we've seen 39 ADUs up to today. We'll probably see at least 10 to 15 a year coming in. Um, Having said all of this, and I uh, applaud the council, the city staff, and planning board for working hard on this, um, I would like to add a friendly amendment to protect the rights of the ones who have already applied for an ADU and have gotten the permit or are in the phase of the permit to at least extend, and I have the wording written, to extend the right uh, to um, to extend, if, if I can read it, let me read it. Property owners with existing ADUs or property owners that have a valid conditional use permit for an ADU who choose to enter into 12 month minimum long-term leases for local residents and are willing to place a deed restriction on the property for a minimum of five years, that the ADU must be leased for a minimum of 12 months to a local resident may have the deed restriction that prevents the rental or lease of the accessory dwelling if the owner does not maintain permanent residence of the primary dwelling immediately removed. My point is, if uh, we're giving an incentive uh, and to someone who applies today and there is no primary residency occupancy required to the ones who apply tomorrow, if there is someone that has already an ADU and decides to deed it for five years for long-term rental to give them the same privilege. So that's my only friendly amendment to the whole uh, ordinance. Okay. 
Thank you. Do we have a second to the motion? Then we can well, carry further discussion. That's right. Yeah. So I, I'm not 100 percent sure if I agree or disagree. It, I think it's very hard to take such a long and complex amendment in my head. I don't without seeing the language in front of me. It, you're basically saying, how do we address? all of the existing ADUs to get them the same as what we're proposing what to do, right? Yeah, if, if we can word it, we can ask staff to word it. What I'm asking is, uh, with this new ordinance, we are waiving occupancy of the primary residence, right? All I'm saying is, uh, the ones that already built an ADU, they built it by the rules existing at that time. But uh, let's keep them one of the incentives if they want to deed restrict it for five years for 12 months lease by saying, you know what, when you applied, you had to stay on the residence. Now, if you're doing this, we will waive that restriction. Can I make a suggestion? What if we ask staff to come back with a proposal to bring old ADUs in compliance with the new ordinance? If we pass this. So, I mean, that, that was one of the questions that you know, we discuss is what kind of incentives can we use for the existing ones that are out there. I mean, this is by ad adopting this as a written, does that basically remove that requirement for the existing ones that they, because they all have a deed restriction, they can't remove that deed restriction with the city's, without the city signing off on it since we require them to have that deed restriction. Um, one of the incentives might be if you want to come in and join this program for 12 month long term leases, then the city will sign off on you, your ability to remove that deed restriction immediately. So you're not restricted to live in the main unit if you want to make your ADU a 12 month lease. And maybe whether it's five years or three years, I don't know what the best timeline is, um, but that's a potential. And so um, Giuseppe talked to me about this and I actually put together that language that he read just as an example for him. Can I ask so a question? It might be able to be massaged a little better. Dave, yes. Who, who enforces the deed restriction? The city? Well, the city does currently. Okay. So are we going to continue to enforce the deed restriction after we pass this ordinance that that's allows? A, that's a question. Well, Steve, it, it's, the deed restriction gets um, recorded, so it's part of title of the property. So, I mean, enforcement's always going to be difficult. But um, if they wanted to, you know, sell their property, that deed restriction would still be recorded against their property. So. Could, could we, do we have a process for removing a deed restriction for somebody to come in and just remove it rather than add this complicated amendment to this ordinance at the end? That's my, that's my real question here. We know we're not going to enforce it. We're gonna, Why would we're we gonna enforce uh, we're gonna enforce the uh, some a deed restriction on a property that is out of uh, that doesn't jibe with our current law that we just passed. You're assuming, Steve, that the person that has the particular ADU that we proved as part of the CUP um, uh, is enrolled in or promised to, in fact. Uh, lease their property out for a minimum of five years at 12 months a time. That's not true of all ADUs. That's not true under these amendments. Not all ADUs will be, um, have a deed restriction on the, pro uh, will have, uh, some will have a deed restriction on the property because they're not in the program. They will have to be owner occupied and, uh, but they won't be restricted on who they can or if they decide to rent, uh, rent out the ADU. Okay. Yes, ma'am. I, I want to just clarify. The ordinance that's in front of you allows both units to be rented regardless of being in that program. It does? Yes. So I just want to clarify that for you because that's how it is proposed in the packet. Is there a second to Giuseppe's motion? It, it looks like it's going to die. It's also going to die a, a sad death. No, no second for that one. Um, that brings us back to the primary motion. Giuseppe, any further discussion on the motion? None. Uh, any further discussion on the primary motion? 
Well, I have a question. If this is a poison pill, I'm going to withdraw my second. Like if, if, if it's not going to get passed, uh, we're not doing ourselves a favor because these two amendments didn't pass. And I let to the extent that um, I am unhappy and we're doing this at this particular council meeting, I want to assure the public and any other member of our council that has any concerns about this and wants to bring it back off the consent agenda next time for further discussion by this council and amendment, I will probably support this thing in that guise. Okay. Thank you. So you understand. All right. Uh, I just want to say a couple things that um, this has been a long time coming. It's been vetted and through several public processes and it's time that we act on this and I, and we can still fix it. If there are things that need to come back next time, then we can do that. Um, but it is time to move this thing forward in this form with the idea that maybe it'll get pulled off the consent agenda. Uh, we have We have spent a lot of time on this and we know we need to do it, so we need to do it. Thanks, Steve. Any further comments from council? I, I'm just going to concur just for the public and for my other fellow council members. I do um, support this ordinance. I think this is an important change that we need to pass. I think we've, maybe it's just me because I'm on the housing committee, but we have debated this thing extensively for a very long time. Um, I feel good about what's there. I would like to see it move forward. I'm always open to new ideas. I think if other folks I know this is a weird situation here tonight um, with, with the composition of council that we have. If, if other members would like to pull it off the consent agenda at the next meeting, um, I will support that no matter what, even if I don't support why you're doing it, so we can continue to discuss it. Um, but I, uh, I know for myself, I, I think that um, the community needs help, the community needs housing. I think this is an important piece of that puzzle. It's been around for a long time. And, um, and personally, I feel that we should pass this um, when we can. Great. I think um, any further comments? That said, all those in favor? All those opposed, like sign. Motion passes unanimously. Until next time. Next, we're moving on to council. You want to proceed? You want to take a quick break? Keep going. All right. Uh, next is our proposed ordinance uh, 22-07, I believe it is, an ordinance amending the Whitefish City Code to Article, Article Y, Chapter 2, Title 11, to establish WBT Zoning District, Business Transitional District, as uh, implementation of the Highway 93 South, South Corridor Plan. First reading. All right, good evening again. Um, so this is, I'll probably give you an overview of this since it's been a while since this was before the council. Um, this went to the planning board on January 20th, went to the first public hearing at the council on February 22nd, um, closed the public hearing and then it was postponed for an additional discussion to March 7th, uh, where we had a work session and then we had another one on April 4th um, where we went over this stuff, brought forward some changes to you guys. So um, WBT, Business Transitional Zoning District, again, um, it was something that was one of the implementation items of our recently adopted Highway 93 South Corridor Plan. And one of the first objectives, <coughs> excuse me, was to create this transitional zoning district that would be a, a um, a buffer between the county business service center district and our B2 secondary business zoning, um, that only applying on areas where there's existing county B4 secondary business right now. Um, and that existing county B4 has you know 39 permitted uses, things such as automobile repair, grocery stores, hotels, restaurants, all those types of uses are permitted right now in that zoning district. Um, and in order to entice uh, folks with that zoning in order to annex into the city and to connect to city services, 
Um, the 93 plan tried to come up with a zoning district that would be enticing enough um, without major changes in uses, but maybe moving most of the uses to that were more traffic intensive to the conditional use category from the permitted uses. And so out of the work sessions that we've had, um, <coughs> the council has directed us to remove most of those uses that had high traffic in them. Um, such as, you know, automobile sales, hotels, restaurants, um, building supply outlets, contractor related uses, wholesale and warehousing were all removed from the permitted uses. And then in the conditional uses, as I mentioned, automobile, boat, RV sales, rentals, repair, service stations, convenience stores, bars and lounges, entertainment facilities, hotels and motels, machinery equipment um, were all removed. And then uh, multifamily up to 18 units w uh, were permitted use and a CUP is required for a multifamily above 18 units. And then based on your direction, the Vulcan scale standard reduced the conditional use permit requirement from 10,000 square feet um, down to 7,500 square feet. So if someone has a building with a footprint of 7,500 or more, they would have to get a conditional use permit regardless of the use. Um, so those are the, basically the last draft that we saw. We didn't really get a lot of direction from you as far as um, changes to that. However, um, yeah, we are back before you guys to adopt this. Staff does recommend approval of this as written. I know we had some comments from um, you know, property owner along there that does have direct access to the light intersection of Highway 40 that was concerned that, you know, removing a lot of the other uses that would normally be allowed in the B2 um, severely limits their property, even though they don't have the same access issues that properties south of there have. Um, so that's something to consider. But in general, uh, you know, staff recommends approval of this zoning text amendment. I'm glad to answer more questions. Any questions for David? Please. Um, David, question again, generalized question here. Our interest in having a transitional zone out there has to do with um, conditions under which we would take on a piece of property and bring it into the city and provide services to it. We have an awful lot of commercial uses, both permitted and conditional under this circumstance, that are inconsistent with, and not necessarily even supplementary to, um, the residential uses that we would hope go out there and would actually require our services. Why, hypothetically, would we um, not simply say that we will extend our services for only those types of activities in that area that are consistent with our desire for and would have the need for, quite frankly, um, our city services and just leave it at that? Well, I mean, currently under the county zoning, there's a lot of uses that can happen out there. I mean, you can sure. build mi mini storage units yep. until the van comes home. Um, you know, any kind of commercial, you know, we see a boat sales facility. There's all kinds of uses like that that don't require city services. They can happen right. out there, and that will continue to happen um, because they can't get city services. So... The development's going to be different if they if they have city services, and there's certain uses that we think are appropriate, and some of them that aren't appropriate. Um, how, you know, the uses that have the high traffic uses that have the most concerns are the ones that are in the conditional use categories. You know, things like professional offices. I mean, really, all we're saying is light assembly, professional offices, and residential. Those are the main uses listed in the permitted uses in this. You know, we adopted this as part of our growth policy. We have a future land use map that's been adopted that calls for a transitional district over this area. Mm -hmm. um, so anything else that doesn't isn't consistent with that is going to be inconsistent with our adopted growth policy and we may have to go back and amend that if it changes substantially. But 
you know, the intent of this district is, you know, light commercial ancillary services, fronting the highway with single family to high density residential uses typically located behind to provide a performance based mixed use environment in a highway community gateway setting. And then due to high vehicle speeds and high traffic uses should be discouraged and frontage or back of roads should be developed to consolidate highway accesses. And so we're creating a district where residential is something that would be permitted you know, um, which wasn't, you know, part of the original thing, but I think we modified this because the council looked at that as an, I an ideal area for potentially more high density residential or other types of residential. while still understanding that right now, you know, it's the existing uses on those parcels or that are getting developed on those parcels. We have, you know, we have a, a doctor's office and we have a church mm -hmm. and we have, you know, a boat sales clinic and um, some other property that's vacant that, you know, could be used for a multitude of different things that's in that zoning. And I get, but my, my quandary is this. Given what we say that we want or that we think we want to support out there as a city and a community, which is residential development of some kind or character, I could understand how we could have a transitional unit that said, okay, you can have a daycare on your property and you can come into the city, but you also have to provide some number of residential units on the property to make sure that we've got mixed use and we've got the, for lack of a better description, we're incenting the kinds of development out there so that they can get city services, as opposed to, quite frankly, I don't think a church light assembly necessarily, or even medical clinic, need or want or would be willing to come into the city to pay higher taxes, and we wouldn't get what we want and what we hope to have out of that. that uh, and I know we're going to get a lot of other stuff, and I've, my, my rhetorical question to us all is to understand that no matter what zoning we put out there, it's still free-for-all. We, by zoning it that any particular way, the city doesn't necessarily get what we're zoning for out there. Um, that's hard for everybody to kind of grasp, thinking, well, well, you zoned it, why didn't you get that? Well, we don't own it yet. Um, so that's really the, the background behind my question and rationale here, is, is if that's the case, and what we're really saying is that what we want from that area, if you want to come into the city, is some portion of residential development. This does not, as it's currently written, do that, does it? Well, no, because it's based on what was adopted as part of right. the corridor plan. And, right. and, you know, typically high density residential out at the fringe of your community, outside of your services, isn't an ideal zoning technique. Okay. You want your zone, you want your higher density closer to town where people no, can no. walk and ride their bikes and all those types of things. Right. Right. And that's an area where, you know, potentially residential could occur. It's also very high traffic. You know, you got some ma two major highways intersecting there, so there's a ton of traffic noise. Again, not ideal for residential. Potentially, if you had some commercial uses in the front that buffered that, then it might be able to work. But, um, but calling that area, just from a planning standpoint, just for residential uses, I mean, isn't really ideal planning practices at an intersection like that with the amount of traffic that's going by there. Um, but and that's why, you know, you know, with the existing county zoning, I mean, we see, you know, there's a hotel by the airport that is built on a septic system. Right. Things can, those things can happen. How do we encourage those things? Once they come into the city, then we have architectural review control. Right. We have site development standards. We have groundwater standards and, you know, stormwater runoff standards that the county doesn't have or doesn't enforce, which is why we see, you know, proper, you know, there's a lot of other issues that we're solving by trying to encourage them to come into the city and why we may not get all the uses that we foresee it's really going to be up to the developers but most of the types of uses that are going to be the most egregious or more traffic oriented will at least be a public process because there'll be a conditional use permit the buildings will be over 7500 square feet the use is going to require it to come to the city council and the neighbors will be able to weigh in and so we're creating a framework that at least with enough uses that hopefully the ones that do need city services will be like you know I, I can make this pencil I'll agree to annex and I'll agree to go under the city standards and hopefully the council will, you know, I'll do a, a nice enough project that the council will approve it. Otherwise, they're not going to ever annex. They'll just stay in the county and do whatever they can do out there. I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, but I think that the, what I have heard from 
a number of members of this community is that um, the primary reason that we should have this transitionary zone out there is so that we can encourage or create some additional housing units for the city. That said, all I'm identifying here is that based on what I'm reading and based on what I've seen, that's not even a primary driver behind this. It's a possibility, but it's not a primary driver. And again, I'm just clarifying I mean, again, things to make sure we understand. Course, um, with the way the zone's written, you know, multifamily is a permitted use up to 18 units. So somebody could go out, you know, if the building's over 7,500 square feet, they're still going to get, to have to get a conditional use permit. But somebody could build residential as a high density residential as a permitted use. Correct. That's encouraging residential. Correct. So that's, you know, and then over that, obviously, you know, you get over a certain number of units, you want to look at traffic and you're going to have to have traffic studies and figure out where the egress and their ingress is and their right. all that kind of stuff. But, but, you know, by adding that use in there is definitely something that's encouraging that residential right. use. Right. You know, and if you want, you know, as when we were at the work session, uh, I think Councillor Freer is the one that talked about, you know, a mixed-use environment where there's some potentially local services and there are built types of buildings that would buffer, you know, those residential uses. You have to allow some certain uses in there to be able to go along the highway. What types of uses are appropriate there? You know, I don't know, but we... You know, obviously there's offices or something that could go in there, light assembly. Um, we removed a lot of the other types of uses that you normally see in a mixed-use environment, um, right. such as hotels or other types of things. But right. um, Can I interrupt for a sec, Frank? I Let just me finish my questions. Okay, and then I just want to ask you a question. Sure. sure. Are, are, you, are, you, are you offering that if, if somebody wants to come in and, and – Put use it, have a business use out there that they would have to also build some housing. Is that kind of the angle you're taking? That's that one of the recommendations because again, okay, and, and that's why I'm asking. I want to okay, clarify because I think we're going in circles with the the business uses versus business tied to also requiring residential. My, my my what I'm trying to get to, Steve, and I'll get to if we get to a motion later, I'll get to that. Is identifying here what we get, what we're incenting. And what, and so that's all I'm trying to identify for at this particular point on David's uh, staff report. I'm not trying to change anything on, at this point. Um, are there any other questions for David on the staff report? Well, we call for a public hearing on this matter, and so I'll open the public hearing now. Um, is there anyone who wishes to speak on this matter? Mary. Good evening again, um, Mary Flowers, Citizens for a Better Flathead. Um, we are disappointed to be before you this evening not able to support what should be the city's clear vision for housing south of Highway 40, and certainly not the policy before you that still, we feel, allows for inappropriate commercial development down Highway 93 and only calling for housing behind this commercial. Um, again, developments like uh, the um, Silverbrook clearly shows that you can do residential along the highway. Um, we do not appreciate, we do appreciate the work that you've done to remove additional uh, commercial uses from this quarter, from the original plan and we really do applaud you for that um, I think Frank just now created a vision that I think is what we are hearing the public wants as well is to be clear that housing should be the primary goal of what we're doing for going forward um, I think the question that hasn't been asked of you Clearly enough is, if you had total control over this quarter, what would be the vision? And I think that's what you should be saying 
is this is what we want. I think that's what the public wants you to do. I don't think your vision should include uh, uses that aren't even clearly defined in your own zoning code, and I've outlined these. Like commercial and its ancillary services are called for in the intent. Um, they're not defined, and they sound like a, over time, a creeping, sprawling commercial down the corridor. Light food manufacturing and processing called for as a permitted use. What is it? What does it include? Can you make your own, own pasta and other foods and have a tasting room and essentially have a restaurant? Um, does it include distilleries and breweries because they're manufacturing light manufacturing of food? There's no definition in your code. The performance based, based mixed use environment again called for in the intent. What is performance based? Is mixed use really just a commercial strip with token housing inserted? Storage facilities and enclosed buildings. I think I've seen every one of this, you on the council say, you don't want to see more storage units. And yet this is within a use identified as a permitted use. Um, we don't have a definition of storage facilities in enclosed buildings. And I think this needs to be addressed. How do you find to find terms like limited access points? In the comments I've provided you previously, Kalispell identifies them as one half to a mile apart um, so that we're creating nodes rather than strips. But again, that's not defined in here. Um, high traffic uses should be discour discouraged. But what is a high traffic use? Would it include marijuana facility, microbreweries, and micro distilleries, um, restaurants, non formula, recreational facilities, private and commercial, recreational guides and outfitters? If, as a city council, you are going to ask all of the residents and businesses in the city of Whitefish pay more for our sewage treatment plant and our water treatment plant to extend these services past Highway 40. And that's how our annexation laws work. All city residents have to pay to upgrade those facilities as the city grows. If we're going to have to, if we're going to tax residents, I think we really need to look at what are the uses that they would support. And I think housing is that use. Um, do we really need or want to invite beyond Highway 40 or just across from the Newtown Pump a large outdoor display of recreational rental equipment for which there is no limit for the size of the district, the lot coverage, or limits on outdoor displays in this new district? Does a boat business become a permitted use if it offers state licensed guides and outfitters? I think there's just too much uh, undefined and murky vision. And that's why I say, Frank, I think you boiled it down to a very clear, concise vision for housing, recognizing that there could be some business uses associated with that. But the primary use is residential. Um, why does this proposed zone, not as it originally was proposed, have a concept plan uh, before annexation can be considered? I think, again, I heard with the town pump, it would have been much preferable to have that kind of annexation concept plan with the earlier development item uh, next to Park Knoll to have a concept plan before annexation, those are the kind of tools that you need to make the decisions you're being asked to make. Um, and why do you keep the name business transition zone? If what the public is saying, and I think that's what we're hearing overwhelmingly, is that they want to see housing, let's call this a housing transition zone. 
let's really set a clear vision. Um, in this, I'm also including our comments that I made at your work session on 422, just because it provides you more information. Um, I would strongly encourage you to um, not make a decision tonight. Uh, I think there's a more work that needs to be done, and I uh, was surprised to see it on your agenda tonight without more council consideration. Um, I would encourage you to keep the public hearing open and to continue to work to really articulate the vision for the housing that this community, I think, would get behind you and support. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. Any other public comment on this matter from the room? Not seeing any here. Michelle, do we have anyone online? Nathan, if you'd like to um, unmute your mic and state your name and address, please. Hey, Nathan Dugan, 937 Kalispell Avenue. Um, don't have a lot to say on this. I do get a little bit concerned um, when we start talking about putting like Silverbrook like developments out in this area that's over two miles from our downtown core um, when we clearly have a very um, large amount of land between this space and our downtown core. Um, and so I question whether we actually care about traffic and the environment. Um, and we saw uh, Whitefish Mountain Resort and Explore Whitefish partner with POW, um, protect our winners, obviously important in Whitefish as a ski town. And we, their number one goal is to reduce emissions. Um, if we're putting a lot of very low density housing out here, and I wouldn't, I don't want to see high density out, housing out here for another 20 years, to be honest. And that's, that's something I advocate for. And you all know that, um, we have other places to put it that are a lot closer before we need to start looking at this. Um, I worry that we're looking at this as a band-aid. It's an easy place to put housing. We can say we're doing something, um, you know, while, while forgetting about kind of our climate goals and um, not really planning very well for the future in that, in that regard. And so um, those are my concerns. I just want to put them out there on the record. Um, I think that we can, we can do better. And I, I really hope that we, don't build a Silverbrook like department, uh, Silverbrook like development out there. I, I kind of see that as like the, the Texification of Whitefish in a way. Um, Texas is a place I've spent far too much time since my family decided to move there, unfortunately. And um, my parents live in San Antonio and they live 22 miles from the center of San Antonio in a single family home on a very tiny lot. You can touch the neighbor's house. Um, because everybody has to live in a single detached home and they're 22 miles from downtown. Traffic is horrendous. The roads are 80 million feet wide. And I, I, I as someone who sits on the, the, um, the climate action plan committee, I can't advocate for that. And, and I, I think that we should look a little bit further down the road and make sure that we're, we're using our land effectively and efficiently. That's it. Thanks. Thanks, Nathan. Anyone else we got, Michelle? Nope, that's it. With that, I'll close the public hearing and turn it back to council. Deputy Mayor, uh, I make a motion to approve WZPA 22-I think 07 at this point. Uh, the finding of fact in Exhibit B and language in Exhibit A is recommended by the Whitefish Planning Board in January 20, 2022 and further amended and refined by the city council and staff. We have a motion. Is there a second to the motion? I'm afraid your motion dies a natural death. Just for the record, yes. I made this motion on 2 22 right. And uh, <laughs> my destiny is to die three times before we get to it. So, and uh, I, I thought Nathan said taxification or taxification. Taxification. Okay, thank you. Mr. Deputy Mayor, I'd like to make a motion to postpone indefinitely Ordinance 22-07, an ordinance amending the Whitefish City Code to add Article Y, Chapter 2, um, Title 11, to establish a WTBT zoning district. 
point of clarification, um, Angie, is it a, if I read your motion correctly, to indefinitely, is it lay on the table or is it postponed indefinitely? It will lay on the table until you revive it. So that's what happens, postponed indefinitely. Okay. There you go. Or second to the motion. I mean, it's one or the other, right? Uh, yeah. So I'm the third guy here. Yeah. Um, I'm going to second Steve's motion. And I'm just going to say, I, I don't, I struggle real hard with this. And I, on one hand, I look at what's in front of us and I don't know intuitively how to make it better. But I also look at it and I say, gosh, is that really what we're trying to do? I mean, I know when this originally came forward, I, I think I voted against the extension of services to Opera 40 because I, I just still struggle with what that's supposed to be. Um, I think I potentially could support this maybe, um, but I'd feel pretty iffy about it. Um, I don't know what else to say. <laughs> Well, I just want to say I, I'm, I'm a little bit torn. I, I agree with a lot of the points that you make, Dave, that, you know, in, in some respects we need to get out ahead of this because if, peop if businesses do want to annex in, we don't have any ability to do anything about how they do it. The other side of that is that I, I don't see anybody with property out there wanting to annex in to do a business because you typically don't need a, more than a septic to, to create a business even if it's an office building. Um, I also don't, we have a lot of land in the city that is undeveloped and underdeveloped. And I want to echo Nathan's point that before we start building another, pro any sort of large housing project out there, which I know we need, that, that goes against our climate action plan because people are going to have to drive. And it also is a hazard out there. I drive, I drive there every single day of the week, except the weekends if I can avoid it. And it becomes ha more hazardous every single day. And putting more housing out there makes it more hazardous. Putting more businesses out there makes it more hazardous. I also don't want to see a whitefish marine, which seems to keep growing regardless of whether or not they're meeting the county requirements, because it looks like it looks bad. It looks really, really bad. So uh, I'm torn, but I just don't, I, I don't want to do something because we feel like we have to do something. And that's what I feel like we're doing at this point. I also don't think we need to be encouraging large developments out there. It just doesn't make sense to me. But I think what we need is a clear vision of what we want out there, figure out how to enact that vision because it is the corridor entrance to our town. We don't have any control over it <coughs> right now, currently, and this is one way to enact control. Um, but I, I don't know, I just don't, I think we need a better annexation plan and we wanna see things before somebody annexes in in this particular area, for sure. Mr. Sapi. Yes, I have a couple of questions. One uh, about the process. Uh, Angie or Dana, this is an ordinance we're discussing and uh, the motion that uh, Councilman Cunell made, does it require unan unanimous vote to postpone because it's an ordinance we're discussing? That's my first question. I don't believe so because the city code reads that it's to approve an ordinance. Right. So I think that you could probably make a motion to postpone indefinitely. Okay, um, that, that was the first question. The second question I have to Steve, um, this is month, uh, March, April, May, month number three that uh, on top of the work city staff has done to present it in February that we're working on this. Uh, are we, are you planning to give directions to staff or you expect to do a work session uh, so that when we discuss we have something different? 
Yes, eventually we would need to have a, a, a work session to give staff further direction. We're not in that, I don't think we have that capacity tonight to give them further direction to come back with another ordinance at another time. But I, I can't wrap my head around this right now and I don't, I, I think Ben is feeling the same way for sure. And I, I don't know where to go with it to be honest with you, which is why I said indefinitely. Further comment? All those in favor of the motion? All those opposed? Uh, motion passes as it is, three to one. And brings that matter to a close. Our next matter is a resolution, I believe it's resolution 2209, a resolution amending an agreement with the Montana Waste System. Um, regarding solid, solid waste collection. Great. I think this is bear proof containers in short. That it is. Um, thank you, Deputy Mayor and City Council. Uh, my staff report is on page 30, 375 of the packet. Um, and first I'd like to thank Republic Services for um, having the representative Chad's here, uh, Jake and I'm not sure if there's other representatives here, but they're here. I've sat through this entire meeting waiting for this um, item on the agenda. But as you know, during the past um, couple years, we have been working with Republic Services as well as Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks to really look at the um, bear issues that we have had in Whitefish for numerous years at this point, uh, where we have um, garbage that um, is being um, accessed by bears. 300 gallon containers are being tipped over in the alleys quite frequently during the spring and fall season. So our um, city code does require some uh, securing of garbage right now. Uh, one of the biggest issues we have though are the 300 gallon containers that are in our alleys. These 300 gallon containers are often shared by multiple homes and um, we do have some downtown as well for businesses. But uh, there are no animal resistant containers available for a 300 gallon container because that would um, obviously be the easier fix here. Um, but we are looking at moving toward um, individual containers uh, for all residential homes that might currently have a 300 gallon container. And in addition, all single 95 gallon containers citywide would be moved to bear resistant containers. Um, during a work session that we had uh, with uh, the city council, uh, we were directed to bring forward this amendment um, and the possibility of adding this mandatory bear resistant container program for the city. The total cost per month would increase to $15.75 per residential unit. And with that, there would be no one-time fee for the initial container purchase. There would be no delivery fee for the transition period in, in which uh, Republic would be changing out containers. And um, there are two additional items though to make this work for Republic Services. One is to make the amendment um, increase the term of the contract to 10 years instead of five years. And the annual rate increase would increase from uh, 3% to 3.25%. Um, you know, after uh, reviewing the proposal and um, listening to the public, uh, you guys did again re request that we negotiate this amendment with Republic Services. Uh, we have confirmed that given the logistics of our alleys and the, um, how narrow they are, as well as how many containers would have to be placed in an alley, that alley service would not be possible. That change would be quite challenging for some residents that have used these 300 gallon containers. Uh, they've been stationary in the alleys, so individuals would take their garbage to them. Now they would be required to move a garbage container in and out, much like other residential areas in Whitefish. Um, and in talking with Public Works Director Workman, uh, we may have to consider making changes to the alternate side parking ordinance to make this really work well in that basically we would have alternate side parking year round. Um, if approved, the um, amendment anticipates an August 2022 um, 
the end of August 2022 implementation completion. And um, that, of course, is hopeful that uh, Republic can order the containers, get them delivered and exchanged within a reasonable time. We obviously know that there are some delays in the supply chain, and so um, we would obviously be open to working with them on that timing as well. So this amendment would increase the costs of the city for garbage service to about $283,000 a year. That's based on an estimated 3,950-ish um, residential accounts. We would have to pass that cost increase on to our customers as we don't have another rev revenue source other than the rates for service. Um, so we would be looking at increasing uh, residential rates um, on a monthly basis from a, right now it's um, 1078 a month to uh, which includes uh, $9.79 that is going to Republic Services and the city retains an administration fee of 99 cents. Um, we would be looking at an additional $5.97 added to that for a total of $16.75. I will say that administration fee may also increase just as we do um, annual rate increases as well and we're looking at the cost of staffing and um, our supply costs um, on a normal basis, but um, it wouldn't be fairly significant. So that does represent a 55% increase on a, a resident, um, so it is something to consider, but um, we do believe that this is the best solution to minimize the risk of bear and human conflict in whitefish, to make sure that our bear population um, is not at risk of being terminated, I don't know how to say that appropriately, um, but bears are at risk because if they are habituated to garbage, um, they also um, may have to um, be handled by FWP. Um, so with that, um, I, if you have any questions, um, Republic Services is here to help answer those logistical questions, the ones that I might not be able to answer, um, but I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Um, any questions for Dana on her staff report? Thank you, Dana. Um, just for my understanding and for the number of letters that I received, um, there are there is a situation where, where we have the big containers that are shared, mm -hmm. and they need to be replaced if we want to be proactive against the, the bear problem. They need to be replaced with something that is locked, and obviously the big containers won't, won't be uh, uh, able to do that. So we're saying that whoever has been using and paying for the share container now will be required to have a, a single use 95 gallons can, which is also bear resistant. So we're also um, asking, telling the citizens that they're gonna change their process. Instead of dumping the garbage in the alleyway, they will need to be uh, pulling the container out to the curb mm -hmm. with certain rules and regulations about that, which will impact parking as well, but that's a different discussion. Mm -hmm. So I understand that correctly. Yes, that's okay. correct, but it's also other residents that might not have a 300 gallon, they might have a single use right now, they would also be transitioned to bear resistance. So, we'll get, so that's the second part of my question is, the ones who had a single can, a 95 gallon can, they were already affected by an ordinance, if I'm correct, that was to prevent this problem, which was enforced or not, doesn't matter, uh, and it was way in the past where people are supposed to keep those containers either in their garages or in, in, in areas where, and that is still in place, right? That is still in place. Enforcement is um, a challenge. I understand, but, but that, there is an ordinance. So the city leadership has acted in the past to this issue and now there is a trigger point if i'm interpreting correctly that is the big containers that are shared if everyone had a single can and everyone kept it in the garage we would not be addressing this issue for this particular reason am i correct yes and no i think the enforcement side of what we're seeing um, even with our regulations right now is we don't I, I mean i think we would have to have somebody going around like all day every day right and the reason I'm asking those questions is because uh, I had letters from citizens. Normally, I, I, I go with the staff's recommendation and I go with the planning board. But in this case, it's a legislative act. 
and um, I got to listen to the voters, and I, I was surprised by the number of letters I received who said, I'm an elderly person, I've been moving my can from the garage out and back, and now because there is a different type of problem, I'm going to be penalized money-wise and process-wise, and I don't even know if I'll be able to do without calling my grandson to help me every Monday or whatever. So that's the reason, those are the reasons of my questions. And uh, personally, I'll be all for it, but I'm trying to filter these comments. Thank you. Anybody else? Dana, a question for you. Explain to me again, or some, one of you guys can tell me, why if I've had a 95 gallon container in my alley and everybody's been able to get in there and dump it, why do I now have to take it out to the front curb? So the ones in the alley are 300 gallon. Not all. If there is current service that's a 95 gallon, that I don't believe would be proposed to change. Our under my understanding, and Jake might be able to speak to this, um, is that the ones where we have 300 gallon containers would not be able to accommodate uh, that many 95 gallon containers appropriately throughout the alley because of parking that's in there as well. Um, they have to be spaced a certain number of feet apart for it to grab. Um, you know, right now we have a 300 gallon, so. Um, okay, but, so what I hear you're saying, and this goes to some of the questions to Seppi, if I currently have a 95 gallon container, and I currently simply roll it out of my garage and take it to the back, to the alley, I'm still gonna be able to take it out of my garage and roll it to the alley and get it dumped. Do you, I'm sorry, Jake, I know. We do have some people online if you don't mind. Yeah, so I, I would say that as of right now, there's almost none uh, 96 gallon containers serviced in an alley. They're all curbside. I'm not saying there are zero. I'm saying that it's almost none. Okay, and I guess my, again, my rhetorical question and actual question is, if I do have a 95 gallon, uh, gallon container and I roll it to my, uh, uh, my alley, I'm still going to be able to do that when we transition to bear resistant. Uh, I would say possibly, but uh, um, it would be case by case. I mean, I would have to see the, you know, the location in the alleys. I can't think any off the top of my head. I've been doing this for 12 years. Right. And I can't think of any 96 gallon containers that we service in an alley, um, with the exception of some recycle carts uh, for outdoor cafe. Okay. You just asked, you just opened yourself up for a question. Go for it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You just told me that you do, to the extent you do have. 95 gallon carts at the Buffalo in the alley and you're able to service those. They bring them out to the curb for service. So they bring them to the curb on 3rd Street, I believe it is. Okay. Okay, so you're saying you don't service them in the alley. No, well, we, we did years ago, but as of the last few years, they've been servicing them on the curb. Okay. Um, okay. So the answer to the question is if I've got a 95 pound gallon container, they're not currently getting serviced in the alleys. No, they're curbside. They're curbside. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Um, okay, I don't have any further questions. Gentlemen, I turn this over to you as the council. We have a public we hearing for this item. Oh, we do have a public I hearing. I have a question for Craig really quick. Sure, go ahead. So, Craig, how, how is this going to look? Because, I mean, I've driven down Columbia, I've driven down Park, and you can't even get two cars when down, you know, you have to pull over and wait for somebody to pass you. How are we going to put cans out there? I mean, they're not going to do one side of the street one day and the other side of the street the next day, are they? Yeah, I think that's what they would propose to do is we would have an alternate side parking ordinance and they would pick up uh, the carts that are on the side of the street that don't have vehicles. Okay. And what about the people that don't have driveways? They just have a yard that faces Columbia yeah, or... Yeah, they're going to they're gonna have to find a way to get it um, either through their carriage walk or through their front yard to the curb. Even in the winter? 
Yeah, he's in the middle, sir. Okay. All right, we have advertised for a public hearing. I guess we should hold it. I'm now opening the public hearing on bear-proof containers. Any member of the public wish to speak? Hi there, Jay Wolf, 532 West 2nd, or 2nd Street West. Um, I just think that nobody's even addressing, the, we talk, talk about affordable housing, but this is making town less affordable um, with the Im increased cost. Um, also, I think, you know, I think half the aspect, if I'm, tell me if I'm wrong, but is, is public safety and the other one's just uh, bear safety and keeping them safe and keeping them out of our, so they don't get accustomed to people food. But uh, I can't think of a bear attack on people in Whitefish, Columbia Falls, Big Fork, Kalispell, in the city limits or town limits uh, that's happened that I've read about. I read the paper cover to cover every day. I have never seen that kind of interaction. I think I heard, read something about 19 interactions with bears in the city of Whitefish last year, this year, whatever it was. Um, I think that's, we're in bear country, the way it is. Um, you know, I have lights all the way around the perimeter of my house. So when I go put garbage out at night, uh, I can see what's going on out there. You don't want to have interaction with bears. I mean, we got to, you know, we live in bear country. We should use, use our heads. But I think the affordable housing component is a big thing in the valley and a big thing in whitefish for sure, but we're making it less affordable. Quality of life for bears is going to improve, but not for taxpayers with this, this whole thing going on. Uh, so that's it. Thanks. Thank you. Good evening again. Um, Mary Flowery, Citizens for a Better Flathead. And I want to um, applaud the city and the public works um, leadership in addressing this issue. Um, uh, despite the fact that the prior speaker indicated hadn't seen any harm done yet. I think the problem is it's only going to take one injury. And I think in some of our earlier testimony, we brought you some examples of insurance claims that cities have had to pay for um, harm to their residents. Uh, so I think it's really um, time uh, for the city to move forward with this. I appreciate that it is an additional cost, but I think you've worked to keep it down there. And I also think that um, it's a rare opportunity to move forward with this. There are communities across the West that have put this in place, and I think they're safer, the wildlife's safer, and the residents are safer. And I think it would be really a shame not to give Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, an opportunity to invite them up to just respond to the issue of um, the need for this. Again, I think for the public record, it's really important because um, it's been so long an issue for the city, and I just can't thank you enough for uh, looking at this, and I urge you to uh, move forward with approval of this ordinance. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. So I'm Eric Wenham with Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. Um, we've met many a time. Um, it's been a long, grueling battle. And to sort of set the record straight, um, the gentleman uh, who spoke moments ago said 19 incidents is, uh, it, you know, last year. We know of 19 individual bears that were in town on any given day, uh, and we had multiple hundreds of incidents last year. And just so that you're aware, um, we also had the grizzly bear on Fifth Avenue that killed chickens. Uh, her name was Mara. We, she has been removed at this point. However, uh, four nights ago, we had a radio collar grizzly bear walk down Fifth Avenue. So this is a real deal. Um, and we've talked with the city attorney, we've talked at length about liabilities, 
and for sixty dollars a month per resident or sixty dollars a year per resident when you're looking at some of the settlements that have been throughout the country 17 18 23 million dollars um, I think that would be five dollars a month well spent thanks sir Chad Bauer, North Valley Refuse. Um, Deputy Mayor, Councilors, I just want to make a point and, and thank Dana and Craig for the amount of time that they've worked on this project with us. Um, what I will tell you is where that rate is right now, it will not get any lower. With the, the cost of these bear resistant containers, um, they're increasing every day. Uh, supply is very limited and demand is very high for them. Uh, all across the United States, not just in Whitefish or Columbia Falls or Kalispell. So I guess if I could encourage you to look past the $5.75 a month, because who knows, in, in two months or three months, that could be $9 a month, could be $10 a month for a problem that isn't going away, that will need to be addressed at some point in time. So thank you for your time. I will answer any questions. Steve? Thanks, Chap. Um, I do have a couple questions for you. Uh, you you guys service the recycling that people can sign up for, right? Correct. Okay. Are those required to be bear proof? The, the people who opt into the recycling program? No, there is no ordinance or anything on the recycling side of it right now. Okay. So the people that already opt in for your recycling will, in August, have a bear proof trash container, but a non bear proof recycling container. Is that correct? Correct at this point, yes. Okay. Okay. Um, so just want to point out that that's problematic. Uh, and then 54 cents a year doesn't sound like a whole lot, but um, as somebody whose income only goes up, if I'm lucky, 2.5% a year, at the end of 10 years, we're up to $22 a month for this, but that's locked in. Is that correct? Like you're not gonna, you can't raise it more than 3.25% for 10 years? Correct, that was part of the negotiation. It would be that it's a flat 3.25, so you guys on council can budget every year for what that increase is going to be. Okay. It will not go any higher than that. Okay, will it go lower than that? No. <laughs> okay, uh, just wondering. Well, I, I mean, don't know, I, you know, I, I, just, I, I won't ever say no, but I mean, you know, in five or six years, if inflation's down to a half a percent, well, maybe we look at something like that. Okay, uh, but it won't go over 3.25%. That is correct. Okay. Um, okay, uh, so I just, I just want to point out that it is, it's a, you know, this is a big thing. Not only it's going to be logistically complicated to get people to start toting their trash can through the snow out to the curb along Columbia Avenue through their yard, but it is also, you know, $5 a month doesn't sound like a lot to a lot of people around here, but to people like me, it uh, it is. It's 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 not it's not a thing that is that feels good, um, especially when there is an ordinance that requires people to keep their trash can locked up until trash day. Um, but even with that said, the bears know what streets are trash day, and they'll go out there and knock cans over. So anyway, I'm not opposed to any of this. I want everybody to know that. I just want to point out that it's going to be difficult for a lot of people. Um, and they're, we're going to have to solve the recycling issue as well because if people are going to still opt in, I don't know what that, I don't think we can continue on with that program. Thank you. Any other questions? Could you address the concerns from certain folks that the cans are hard to use or difficult? Yes, I can, I, I can <laughs> address those because I think part of the misconception was is earlier we had used some toter style bear resistant containers that the lids were extremely heavy. Um, they had a metal band inside of them on the lid itself and a metal band around the mesh part of the where they lock together. And I think between the metal getting bent and them getting hung up and the lids on those were extremely heavy with this Kodiak cart, which is a mold injected, plastic injection molding. Um, the lid weighs no more than, I mean, maybe a couple ounces more than your regular 95 gallon carts. Um, just the, the blue ones that are out there. It's got a little slide lock. 
you push it over to the side, you lift the lid up and you put the garbage into it. These are a lot more user friendly than the older carts that we had prior. And just again for clarification, so the public understands, if one of these beer containers gets damaged in the process of dumping or managing, managing them by you guys, they will be replaced by you. I presume that's true. That is correct. That is our responsibility. If we damage it or do something to it, we will replace it. I if one gets hit by somebody, by a car or something like that, we're going to replace it, but we're probably going to ask the city to, to cover those costs or that homeowner, and that's written into the contract. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions from council or do I have a note? Oh, hold on. We haven't closed the public hearing. Oh, we sorry. still have people who want to speak. Okay. Are you ready for online? Um, well, we okay. Could, we have one more here. Not ready for online. Not yet. One more time. Thanks, Mr. Shaw. Hi, Charlie Duffy, 117 Park Mill Lane. Uh, here not to speak on this, but while I'm here, I'd like to have some input. Uh, we were recently annexed into the city of Whitefish, and we were required to have trash containers. It was made apparent to me that it was $10.78 for a regular trash container, and the service to have that bear-proof container picked up was $15. So that 50% increase was for someone that wanted to use a bear-proof bear -proof container. My question is, is that increase that's being proposed right now just to cover the cost of the container, or is it to cover the cost of picking up the container, which is now bear-proof versus a non-bear-proof? Charlie, I believe the answer to your question is, is the cost effectively of amortizing the cost of the new bear-proof containers, if okay. I understand. Okay. So when I looked into getting a, a bear-proof container, I was told there would be a $300 charge in addition to the $15 and change pickup charge. So I'm asking if, if was there a, originally a charge up front for a bear-proof versus a non-bear-proof in addition to the $5 increase, 50% increase every month to pick that trash can up? As I as I recall, I don't know the answer to your question. Maybe yeah. So that. there, there is generally a, a, a c new container charge for the animal resistant. This is a different because we're doing it citywide. Uh, Republic is working with us on it, and that cost the fifteen um, seventy five is taking both the container and amortizing that over the period, but also you know covers any repairs that might be needed. So you would not have an additional three hundred dollars charge on top of the fifteen seventy five. So currently, additional charge, $300, additional charge to pick up, but going forward, this is in place, just the no additional charge for a container, just additional charge for pickup. Correct. Okay. Okay. That was my question. Um, thank you. Thanks, Sean. Any other public comment here in the room? Michelle, online comments. Nathan, if you'd like to unmute your mic, thank you. Hey again, Nathan Dugan. 937 Kalispell Avenue. Um, sorry to talk so much tonight. Uh, try not to, but um, so I do live about uh, less than a block from the river, actually. Um, we do have a 300 gallon container in the alleyway that's serviced back there, and that is pretty convenient. Um, however, uh, you know, myself, Mallory, and our whole house are, are definitely in favor of getting bear resistant containers community wide. Um, Steve, like you, I'm sensitive to the price. The bank wrote me a mortgage for that house that I still have to put a lot of money into to fix up uh, that I can't really afford without roommates, to be quite honest. And I've said that many times. Um, so definitely sensitive to the cost, but I kind of view this as a, a small individual sacrifice for the greater good of the community. Um, I much prefer to ride my bike and walk down my alley compared to the street, even though Kalispell is not a very busy street. Uh, the alley is just like a, a more calming, better place to be, and there's there's virtually no traffic in there. When we come back at night, it's a little bit scary. Our garage faces off the alley. We always have to ride down at least one block um, down the alley, and we, we avoid it other than that, which is unfortunate because that's where we prefer to be, um, you know, because there may or may not be a bear there. Um, you know, you never know, and you're moving pretty fast on a bike, you can kind of um, come up on them pretty quick, and and some bad things can happen, and, uh, you know, I don't want to be the guy that gets knocked down by a bear, and maybe something worse happens uh, to me, and, and then that's when the city takes action, as the, the first guy that commented here uh, today kind of indicated that we should maybe wait for that until we, we make a move on this. Um, so, 
just wanted to say we're fully in support of it being by the river um being somebody that is personally affected by having to now push a can out to the to the sidewalk although i would question um and maybe prefer that it still be serviced off the alley if they can service the 300 gallon containers off the alley i would think that maybe it's feasible to do the other ones even though there's a few more stops um but you know that's about it and hearing about a grizzly bear on fifth avenue that scares me a little bit um you know our new grizzly bear conflict expert used to live a couple doors down from me unfortunately our housing prices in whitefish forced her down to Kalispell, and so um you know i feel a little bit less safe because of that so uh, the housing is never far away, unfortunately, but I do support the bear resistant containers. Thanks. Thanks, Nathan. Any other comments online? No, not. Great. Thanks so much. With that, I think we can close the public hearing and turn it back to council for a motion. After this comments, I have a question for staff. Is it, can I ask a question to the staff? Sure, go right ahead. Thank you. Uh, Dana, you said that uh, this will cost the city, how much more per year? About 283,000 okay. is an estimate. And this is kind of connected to environmental and safety and quality of life in Whitefish. Mm -hmm. Is there a way that part of the resort tax could be used towards rebating or paying that cost so we do not increase the fees to the residents? No, resort tax has to be voted on by the public and so we cannot use those funds for anything other than what was approved by the voters. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Deputy Mayor, I would move to approve resolution 22-09. Is there a second? I'll second it. Um, any further discussion on your speech or your motion? Yeah, the, the cost and extra difficulty of this is not lost on me, but I do, as we've heard tonight, um, there are significant bear human conflicts in town. I, I think I see this uh, as doing our part. Um, and I think we should pass it. Any other comments? You say to me, you speak first. I do. Uh, I have a couple of comments here. Um, this is an ordinance that requires unanimous vote? No. no. Okay, just making sure. Um, I'm concerned about the uh, soda cans, um, the, the, the recycling part of it, because that's a big hole in this master plan that we're trying to put together. I'm concerned about the alternate parking and uh, and how that is going to look like. So we have postponed items tonight because we felt the whole the whole work was not yet done. And now I feel that there is work that could be done. And uh, I understand that the bear is a problem. I also feel I, no, I don't feel I see that we we not completed the work here yet. Uh, I would feel much more comfortable voting in favor because I came to vote in favor until I heard that my letters and some of the public, public comments and some of the answers. If we knew how the parking is going to look like, if we had really thought and addressed what it means for people who have two feet of snow uh, to carry the can out there, um, and how we're going to plug the hole on the recycling that should grow. We want people to recycle. And now they're putting, they can put uh, Coca-Cola semi-empty cans out there that the bear can smell from how long, 13 miles? And so they can have a, a locked can and we're still attracting bear with, uh, with the soda cans. So I know it's late to suggest to postpone it, but those are the reasons why I don't feel completely comfortable voting in favor at this moment. There is, there is a time element here that if we don't approve this contract, the Republic has been very gracious in kind of extending this out and keeping that $5 a can price for us. So Giuseppe, I think that is, that's a big part of the motivation. It's clear that, you know, this country has supply issues, things like garbage cans <laughs> go up in price for no reason at all, really. 
but that's where they are. And I, I do think that Republic has been gracious in kind of granting us some time to bring this all together so that we could that and hold that price steady at five dollars. I think that's it's a big part of what we're doing tonight, uh, at least in my mind. And just to give you any comfort, if I can, Giuseppe, um, on the recycling side, we decided several meetings ago that rather than saddle our residents with compulsory or even uh, requiring them to put bear proof containers for the uh, for the recycling, that additional cost compounded on this was just more than I thought the community and we thought that the community was going to uh, be able to really uh, absorb. And so I, I, whereas I hear that that might be a hold, we've already expected that and expected that when we sent Dana back to renegotiate that. Um, that's not going to change. I think the, the issue on the uh, dragging the carts out, um, I think that comes under the heading of let's see how it let's see how it goes. We can always change it if we can figure out a better way. Uh, but right now there just really isn't. And for us to take advantage of this opportunity, we'll call it, um, I think we need to act now and begin to implement this thing to see what, if anything, we can change um, or need to change as we get into the program. I think that's a. Uh, this is not locked in stone. I think we can look at it as something that we can evolve to and manage as after we've made this commitment. Um, I think that's probably a better way to look at it and understanding that, yeah, there, there are going to be some problems because you're making the change and people are going to have, may have to be changing it. But if that gives you any comfort, I hope. Um, and I think that um, it's time for us to lead on this particular matter and say, okay, we're going to at least commit to get a garbage contain in um, bear proof containers. And the other thing is, is, you know, the practical side is, again, if we're recycling and you're doing it correctly, Giuseppe, keep in mind you put a half-filled can of Coke in a recycling bin, you have virtually contaminated the whole thing and it goes to the trash bin, it goes to the, uh, goes to the uh, landfill anyway. So I think there's some of that going on. And just like Steve said, we wouldn't be here having this discussion if everybody was able to comply with the idea that they would keep their containers in a garage, in a contained area, and only take them out first thing in the morning. We wouldn't be having this discussion. We wouldn't be having these kinds of interactions with our bears. And so I think there's good reason for us to move at least on this matter now because we know it will have, I think it can have a positive impact. With that said, all those in favor of the resolution? Yes. All right. That matter passes four to zero unanimously. And with that, that ends our public hearings for the hear from the for the evening. We have communications from our public works director, and I'll ask council. I know it's late. Does anybody need or want a break? <laughs> I concur. Um, anyway, let's continue on, Craig. Yeah, I think I can break some land speed records here. Um, everybody's well aware of the Spokane Avenue water main project. Uh, we recently bid. Uh, the work came in way over budget. Council rejected the bid. That was back on um, March 7th. Uh, we reopened or re-advertised bids at Council's direction. Um, we opened bids on April 14th. This time we received four instead of one bid. Um, the bids range from 7 to 35 percent above our revised engineer's estimate. Uh, Sandry Construction, um, who was the only bidder on the last round was the low bidder on this round uh, at $2.79 million. Um, so based on that, the estimated cost to complete the project right now is about $3.9 million. Uh, we're planning to budget for that in uh, fiscal year 23, and I recommend that we award the bid to Sandry Construction in the amount of $2,794,444. Questions for Craig? I'll ask the pregnant question. What caused the change in the reduction in the bid second time around? Revised schedule. Yeah, we, we revised the schedule for completion um, next May. So it's now going to be built in two phases. 
that opened up a whole bunch more competition and Sandry Construction knew it. So uh, their bid came down about $600,000. Okay, thanks. That said, no other questions. I'll turn it back to the council for a motion. Move that we award the construction contract uh, for Spokane Avenue Waterman replacement to Sandy Con Standry Construction in the amount of $2.79 million. And I second it. Any further discussion on the motion? All those in favor? That matter passes unanimously. Thank you all. Now, on to communications from our city manager, Dana. What's happening? But you have my report um, in the packet. Um, if you have any questions, please let me know about that. I will say that I did, and you may have received this email, just want to uh, bring light to that um, Amtrak will be resuming seven day a week service on the Empire Builder effective May 23rd of this year. Um, They're also looking at increasing over the next 15 years their expanding service to up to 160 new communities um, nationwide and uh, to provide more inner city passenger rail. Um, opportunities, which will play an important role in tackling the climate crisis, creating economic opportunity, and expanding mobility for millions of people. And I did want to just bring to your attention, as it's been announced um, on Facebook now, um, SOPA Cycle is ceasing operations on June 1st and um, will be uh, vacating the premises by June 30th. So we will be looking for a new tenant in our parking structure and We'll get working on that, working with our realtor to see what the current market rates are and those type of things. So just stay tuned for that one. Dana, are they moving or are they just moving on? I don't know, honestly. Okay. Yep. Great. Any questions for Dana on her staff report? Um, that said, uh, don't seem to be any other questions, any up updates that you want to give us after that report? Nope, that's okay. it. Okay, good, 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 good. Um, communications from the mayor, who's gone, and current city or the uh, present city council. Just happy. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. I want to say that I'm very excited about the ADU's uh, regulation ordinance that we passed tonight, um, and uh, very thankful for it. I voted with mixed feelings about the um, beer resistant um, ordinance. And I feel really, really not well about the people who have expressed their concerns to me. And there were people who were respecting the rules of not leaving the cans out there. So it might be very improper, but I heard Steve here concerned about the fees. I've heard Nathan concerned about the fees. I had two elderly persons concerned about logistics and fees. So I commit personally to uh, gift uh, uh, to 10 people the first full year of difference on their fees, $5.97 uh, for one year to 10 people. And uh, um, Carolyn, Catherine, I'll come uh, when your day is, I'll come to help you pull the garbage can out to in person. Um, uh, I know we need to do that, but personally, I, I feel mixed feelings and that's one way to help a little bit. Thank you, just happy. Okay. Um, I don't really have a comment um, other than that is the Whitefish Trail Challenge. If you, are, uh, if you are on Strava, you can help the trail earn money. Every mile that you put on the trail earns a dollar for the um, Whitefish Trail. The other, I have a, that's my only comment. Question is, did we ever settle on the council retreat dates? We have not, but tonight would not be the date to okay. <laughs> figure that out. I was just wondering, out. If, I, I was wondering <laughs> if I missed something. Yeah. Sorry, I just no, wondering if I missed something. No, you did not. We are, we are probably <laughs> looking at June or July at this point, or who knows when. When are you out of school? Yeah, right, so good, good, good. I think we're good. We'll, we'll probably have to schedule a goal-setting uh, work session um, since, you know, usually we try to talk about that a little bit at that uh, retreat. So we'll, we'll probably have to move forward that with that sooner than uh, when we can get that retreat scheduled. That's my guess. Ben. No comments, let's go home. <laughs> <laughs> I, can, I concur with that. Um, I, I don't have any uh, specific comments. I do have one question for um, Angie. Um, if the ADU um, ordinance 
is pulled from the consent agenda next time, will every member of council and an and it get seconded to pull it? Um, and there's discussion. Will there be a revote of all present councilors on that ordinance? There would be, yes. Okay, so everybody will have an opportunity to vote at that time. And if it is, the, yeah, if a motion to reconsider is, or, or a motion to reconsider, one of you guys would have to make it, but if right. it's pulled off the consent agenda right. for discussion, I believe that you would have to probably, yeah, you could. You could, could, you could what? The second reading could be denied by the council. Correct. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So by the members of the council that were present. Yes. Okay. Yes, but they would still be again, I want to able to present, that. be able to be present and, and vote. Right. Because we assume, you know, you guys, if you're not present at a meeting, you, re you know, you review the minutes and. Right. So. Perfect. Thank you. you bet. I wanted to clarify that as well. Um, with that said, I think the meeting is adjourned. Thank you.